technical uh, things to sort out initially, and Steve is on the phone to the, um, the authorities in charge of this wonderful technology to make sure that you can all get in. In the meantime, I'll do a brief rundown of our program. It's going to start with Steve in the old world discussing what the old chaps did for us. And it's a, a, a little analysis a talk on, uh, I must make sure I have this right, uh, the contribution a contribution of a couple of well-known uh, people. Off with the glasses. Yes. Um, whatever did the old guys do for us? A look at the way in which Kenworthy Schofield and Russell Wortley were influenced by the playing of source musicians. This is source as meaning the original um, um, devotees and creators of uh, pipe and tabor, principally in the Morris area rather than source as something what you put on your chips. So the idea of source musicians as something related to what you put on your chips is indeed a fascinating concept. And you can go with that should you wish. Um, so then we have the, uh, that's part of the old world and that old world I'd theme will be continued with Gwillem, who is going to talk about a mysterious tune, mysterious tune allegedly connected from a pipe and tabor player in the Cotswolds which raises more questions than it, than it uh, gives answers. And indeed, one might well say that the Cotswolds are, um, raises far more questions than it answers. It is a most mysterious place, and I'm looking forward to hear what Gwilym has to say about that. Steve, have we any progress on the, um, the, on the gate? It looks like not. Anyway, uh, that comprises the first half of our programme. In the second half, we go from the old world to the new. And we have a talk from Andy about what was happening in Jamestown, down there in the South uh, Carolinas, I can't remember, Virginia, um, where the earliest settlement uh, of the English in North America uh, took place. And he has some fasc a fascinating account of the pipe and tabor in that area. Um, I, I know a little of, of what was going on in Jamestown. I think the date was about 1610, and uh, there have been recent excavations in which they have discovered various things, including a bit of a trumpet, a bit of a tambourine, and I, I did see somewhere that they found an object which looked as though it might be the fiffle, the head joint, of a recorder-like instrument, but I have not been able to track down the source of that information. Can I, can I interrupt, Bill? Is that okay? Uh, yeah, can I just interrupt um, to um, uh, say that we've now gone live onto uh, YouTube, and I've had to move everybody from one YouTube to another, um, which um, I apologize for. It wasn't what um, uh, the way we planned it, uh, but um, uh, uh, so uh, we can now welcome people to the uh, uh, symposium joining us on YouTube. And I gather we've got nine people watching us on YouTube. Right. So is all, all, that, all that welcoming, what I did, is that gone wasted now? It never went anywhere. <laughs> Into the... Do I have to do it all again? No, there, was, there were other people with us on Zoom as well. So Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, Steve, do you have to give any housekeeping details oh, at this yeah. point then? Okay, so um, this is, uh, so Jez, uh, just want to check with Jez, are you over on the uh, YouTube feed now? I've not had the new link yet. So um, there, I'll, I'll put it to you on here. So sorry about this, we're having some TV yeah, trouble. Change the link. Um, and um, I'm just going to share an email. Um, email just now. I didn't get one. So what has happened is that the um, the uh, what has happened is the YouTube uh, connection between Zoom and YouTube, which normally goes straight forward. You just link live stream to YouTube links to the, the, the uh, YouTube uh, session you've set up. Um, instead of linking to that, it's setting up its own session. 
And so I've had to set up a link uh, so that everybody can uh, go on, on to there. So uh, Steve, oh. five minutes ago, I could get it from the YouTube live chat. Now you've taken that down, so I can't get anything. Right, okay. Why, well, why don't you just leave the, the other thing up there? Sorry, oh, I'm talking to everybody here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so uh, we now have uh, uh, a link on YouTube chat on the original um, uh, uh, YouTube symposium session. Uh, and I've put on the link, uh, put the link on there uh, so that uh, everybody can switch across to the new um, uh, live feed. And we've now got 15 people on YouTube watching. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Rowley, as it says on the screen. Uh, Bill is the chair and Jez, you'll see Jez there. Jez is, uh, he's your friend if you're on YouTube. Uh, because um, Jez can uh, uh, transfer any questions you have to YouTube and uh, he can join us, he can put those questions onto Zoom. And uh, so um, uh, uh, he'll be able to do that. If any of you would like to join us directly in the Zoom um, uh, uh, world, I can. Uh, give you the link uh, on Zoom and I'll put the link on the um, on the YouTube as well. So if you'd like to come and join us on Zoom, please do that. And you can put any questions and you can have a chat on YouTube. And uh, as we go through, Jez will pick up questions or comments to feed through to us uh, on the Zoom anyway. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, Bill, would you like to go through and just introduce everybody again? Yes, no problem. Um, anyway, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Tuck, and I'm responsible for the organ for organizing the, um, the academic part of this seminar. I, I claim no responsibility whatsoever for the technology or its fate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> welcome. I hope we have uh, satisfactorily overcome any of those initial project problems. Um, we have a full lineup of speakers for you this afternoon, all addressing what are very going to be very interesting topics. Our theme, of course, is from the old world to the new, which is metaphorically um, from the old technology to the new. And of course, in our case, it's from the old world of Europe to the new world of the Americas. Um, our first, oh yes, uh, yes, you will, you will note that I have my, my professional hat on, my professorial <laughs> hat, nonetheless, um, and I will um, expect a suitably elevated and academic discussion of the topics that we're going to address. Now, Steve, as first speaker, are you ready with your talk? I, I am ready, and I can... Well, shall I give you the, t the title so that you can go straight in? Whatever did the old, whatever did the old dead guys do for us? A look at the way in which Kenworthy Schofield and Russell Walkley were influenced by the playing of source musicians. And I won't repeat the old joke about the source. Uh, Steve. <laughs> Steve, take it away. Okay, right. Well, uh, let me just uh, change to speaker view. And, um, oh, where am I? Oh, I'm there. I can now, um, I can go to spotlight video. That's me. Hello. And, um, <clears throat> well, welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm going to give a talk that I gave um, last year at Sidmouth Folk Week. Um, a history of Morris music really is the uh, is the title. Um, I just want to check. Everybody can hear me, okay? Can you? Um, I'll just check on Zoom that everybody can hear me. Oh, they're having a good old chat on Zoom anyway, uh, and and on um, on uh, YouTube. Good. Uh, so, yes, I gave a talk. Um, I'm, I've sort of got a bit known uh, at the uh, at Sidmouth. I restarted the talks uh, program there. Uh, 
to the cinema. And um, I, I became a bit known for, um, uh, really for um, having somewhat controversial talks. And so I've, um, uh, this, one, this one was no less controversial uh, uh, than my normal standard of talk. And uh, so I'm going to switch over to share screen, uh, which hopefully you will all be able to see. Um, if I can find it, there it is. Share screen, and we'll go to, there we go. Right, okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, Morris Music, a, uh, a history. And um, let's go and, um, start back in um, time immoral, as they say. Um, in Europe, um, the precursor to Morris is, we find is Moresque. And um, there are a few images of uh, Moresque uh, in the 15th century. And uh, this is a well-known one by Israel van Mechenen uh, of um, uh, uh, four dancers leaping about with uh, great gestures to impress a lady. And that lady, I don't know whether you can see, is holding up her hand uh, like, um, like so with a, holding a, a symbolic uh, item which uh, she will give to one of the dancers um, on their, um, if they you know, impress her a lot. And you can see over on the right, we have the tabara. And um, he's got a very small tabber and a long pipe. I don't know what that says about him, but um, very typical. And uh, <clears throat> here again, we've got another early image of um, uh, tabber playing for dancers. Uh, similarly, uh, gavort, gavot, gavotting, cavorting around. <clears throat> and this is probably the most famous of the Israel Van Mechenen images. And um, we can see there down at the bottom. Uh, the tabara and uh, the lady in the middle, she's holding an apple in her hand and we've got these dancers lepping around. And why is that not, oops. Oh, whoops, gone back, gone too far. Uh, there's the detail of the tabara there. And um, if we leap across to uh, the early um, 16th century, uh, we find uh, similarly gesticulating and cavorting uh, Morris dancers. <clears throat> and here's the famous one from Lancaster, I think about 1510. And you can see the tabara on the left there playing and um, four dancers from the Morecambe and Wise School of Dancing together with uh, a jester and a lady, which might be a lady or a man dressed as a lady with a ladle. And <clears throat> Betley, um, here's another early from somewhere about 1510 again. Uh, you can see in the middle we've got a maypole and just to the right is a tabara and uh, a bunch of dancers. But this time we've got the lady is Maid Marian and she has a rose in her hand. Um, and there's Friar Tuck next to her for some reason. Uh, actually, there is a great similarity. Uh, Mike Heaney has done a uh, a whole lot of work looking at all of these figures here and uh, saying, well, most of them were found on Israel van Mechenen's uh, drawings from uh, the previous century. Um, come forward uh, 1515 or so, Abington Manor, <clears throat> and this uh, fantastic early depiction of Morris. Uh, and uh, here, similarly leaping around, the lady with the the symbolic flower in her hand, the jester, and over here, the tabara. I love this tabara over here. Um, brilliant. And um, a, a, feature, a feature of Morris, which seems to be quite interesting at the time, is showing your bottom to the lady and or leaping backwards over a sword, uh, both of which I think should be um, reinstated into Morris today. Um, <clears throat> coming forward a hun uh, uh, hundred years, um, uh, we've got uh, Thomas Sly here, the tabra playing for Will Kemp in his famous Nine Days Wonder. Um, <clears throat> right the way through at the moment, we're looking only at 
uh, we're finding only tabarins. Um, and uh, that goes to this. This is um, a little bit later. This is in the 18th century. And this is um, um, the Thames at Richmond. Uh, 1620. Yeah. <clears throat> 1720. 1620. 1620. 1620. 1620. Oh, right. uh, 17th century, that's right, 1620. Um, um, and uh, I've got one or two um, uh, sort of uh, notes from uh, different um, uh, pieces written around the time. The famous Thomas Wilkes uh, uh, poet, metaphysical poet, there about um, strike up the tabber in his, in his poem, strike up, strike up tabber and pipe us a favour, for they shall be well paid for thy labour. And he talks a bit further on about the Morris. Um, Lusty dip hopkin, lay on with thy napkin. The stitching cost but a dodkin, the Morris were half undone. Were not for Martin of Compton, a well-said jigging Alice. Those lines, strike up, strike up the tabber, pipe us a favour, thou shall be well paid for thy labour. And... Um, from quite early on, we find that the Taberer was actually paid for his, um, his work playing for the Morris dancers. Um, and uh, we find Taberers featuring in courtly and household accounts and um, being paid. Um, this, uh, this, this painting is, is particularly good. I, um, I've actually been to try and find uh, this exact spot and uh, unfortunately, uh, all of this bank along here is, um, is this is at Kingston, Kingston Thames. That palace has been knocked down, but we know exactly where that palace is. We know where these houses and buildings are, but this bank is completely covered in uh, foliage, uh, trees, big trees. So you just can't see this view anymore, unfortunately. Uh, I wish we could. Um, so it's, oh, let's go and have a look at the Tabra there, the Tabra, um, with several of the other features, the, the, um, uh, the, the hobby horse, a man dressed as a woman, men with, with bells on their legs, and um, over here you can see the, um, uh, the, the jester collecting with his ladle. Um, it's now we come to our first actual artifact. Um, and, uh, you know, things get a lot more tangible when you've got a pipe. And uh, this is the Chipping Camden pipe, uh, known provenance of the first Haber pipe collected in England with any connection to Morris dance, and played for the dancers in Chipping Camden in the 1770s. It's quite an interesting pipe in that it's been converted and converted again. Uh, you can see there are three holes at the bottom, but there's three plugged in holes here. And there is also a hole at the back. And um, examination of this indicates that it was originally a three-hole pipe, converted to a six-hole pipe, and then converted back to a three-hole pipe, and the, um, and the plug from this hole has, has, has fallen out. Um, we also get uh, a lot of other evidence uh, coming through from this period in the 18th century. Uh, a number of good Morris dance tunes came from popular song of this period, particularly well-known uh, ones being found in John Gay's Beggar's Opera. Uh, Steve Roud's excellent talk uh, at Sidmouth a couple of years ago highlighted the role of the pleasure gardens as a source for the bulk of English folk songs. A new songs being written every week to keep the public entertained, and these went on into the music halls. Uh, tunes were often reused to tell different stories. And these tunes were promulgated around the country by the music hall, um, by broadsheets and by traveling shows. Um, Cotswold Morris as an identity becomes real in the 18th, late 18th century and enters its heyday in the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, Keith Chandler in his ribbons, bells and squeaking fiddles has done an excellent job in tracking down and recording the presence of Morris dancers and musicians across the region. Morris dancers were in short supply and uh, many musicians would be uh, required to play for several different teams. 
uh, music was in the family. In a talk I don't think yet published by uh, Keith Chandler, he described the Dorr family of Finstock. Uh, they were both dancers and musicians performing for uh, Finstock and Leefield, which became Fieldtown Morris. Um, and around 1800, that family was able to put up a set of six dancers in their own right uh, for, um, uh, for, for Morris. Uh, and there's quite a lot of uh, interesting material uh, that he describes um, uh, with this family. There's a lot of information on the family as a, a Morris family and as a Morris Tabarez family. He describes how one Whitson, the most important day in the Morris calendar, the family fielded a musician for each team. So one team went off to Leafield, uh, one musician went off to Leafield for their Whitson tour, and the other musician uh, stayed in Finstock for their Whitson tour. At lunchtime, both sides happened to fetch up at the same time at the halfway house, which is on the border between the two parishes. Each side was deter determined to defend what they felt was their God-given right to catch money at this lucrative lunchtime venue. A fight ensued, at the end of which there was but only six dancers left standing. So they combined forces and continued as one side um, uh, so that they could continue and dance around the two parishes uh, collecting the cash, which was rather important to them. Uh, for the musician, it was worth his while to go out on tour for the day, being paid a fixed sum, no matter how poor the pickings were. In the 1850s, Stephen Dorr would charge seven shillings a day. In the 1880s, Charles Benfield up in Bledington in Gloucestershire would take 10 shillings from the collecting box before the rest was shared out amongst the dancers. Um, uh, if we just go back, um, uh, uh, again, talking about the role of the tabula, um, 1733, just dropping back a century, uh, there was a newspaper report that the Tabera Thomas Hill of Hempstead, uh, I believe that's the one in Gloucester, uh, when two of his children were seriously injured in a domestic fire, uh, one of which since died, the other lies dangerously ill, it is observable that the affectionate father was then attending a company of Morris dancers with his Tabera and pipe. And when the news of the melancholy accident was brought to him, he refused to return home saying he would not miss his wits and tide. Um, so the money was very important. You can imagine the, the scale that they were being paid. Um, but it wasn't just about the money. James Simpson of Sherborne, also known as Jim the Laddie, was a tabberer. And in June 1856, he went with his team to play at Borton on the Water and then to Stowe Club, uh, where he stayed until the next day. On his way home, he called at the New Inn and joined in with the party, at which he drank so much he was removed to an apartment. At nine the next morning, he was found in an uneasy state and medical assistance was sent for. But before the doctor arrived, he ceased to breathe with his pipe and tabber in his hand. Uh, so uh, the link between Morris dancers, tabbering and drink is uh, all too clear to see. However, during the late 18. 1800, the pipe and tabber was gradually disappearing. Prior to 1840, almost all Morris, record, where music is noted as uh, the music is um, determined with a Morris performance, it is almost entirely uh, pipe and tabber, whittle and dub, with a rare reference to a bagpipe and flute and drum. Uh, and when they say bagpipe, it might be a misinterpretation of Piper. We don't know. But from 1840 onwards, uh, the fiddle started coming in and then soon the concertina and melodeon. And um, uh, I've got here some of the um, uh, birth dates of the musicians uh, who played the different instruments with, uh, for Morris here. And you can see that the early ones, peaking around 1800, born around at 1800, pipe and tabba, but then um, uh, the fiddle carries on particularly strongly as the pipe and tabba fades away. And then other, which includes concertina, 
and uh, Melodian uh, builds up over on the right there. Um, so why was uh, pipe and tabber disappearing? There was a lack of tabras. Sides reported that they were not able to find a tabra. Um, there was a lack of instruments. Uh, these weren't being made so readily and there were on occasion passed from musician to musician, but many were lost when tabras died. Instrument was not easy to obtain, um, unlike the fiddle, for which there were many makers and importers. And the fiddle was used in many other things. By this time, pipe and tabble was pretty much only used for Morris. There was a lack of teachers. Um, there were an increasing number of people who could teach fiddle, but you could really only learn pipe and tabba if you knew an old tabara, a Morris tabara. There was also a perception that it was difficult to play, playing two instruments at once. Um, but it was also perceived as being um, less sophisticated uh, compared to the more modern instruments. Um, however, here is, these are non-causes for the design. <laughs> um, the sound, the sound was considered to be uh, um, a very uh, important part of the sound of Morris dancing. Um, dancers preferred it and also the audience preferred it. Jinky Wells of Bampton, who was the fiddler, uh, said it was wonderful what they produced from the three whole instrument. And Sam Bennett at Ilmington marveled the mystery is, is, is how did they play all the old tunes on a pipe with a hole under for the thumb and two holes above for the fingers and a little finger, a key finger, with all played with the left hand, uh, which also hung the, the tabba from the thumb, the right hand using the tabba stick. Um, in 1914, Jinky Wells, he described, um, they used to play much slower on the whistle and dub it was very beautiful. You could grasp every moment. Later, he opined, the old style of dancing was much the best. It's a pity the much loved wit and dub couldn't be brought back and it's wonderful players. Uh, for without the slightest knowledge of much education or musical talent, the easy but graceful step to time as a marvel of some rare good players. Mary Neal observed how the oldest dancers would never have tiring, uh, never tired of lamenting how good the pipe and tabba uh, was to dance to, and that the pipe, uh, they do, they lamented the fact that the pipe and tabba had gone out of fashion. In 1858, an eyewitness at Bampton, one Whit Mundy, declared, "The dances were very credibly performed, but we cannot approve of the substitution of the squeaking fiddle uh, for the appropriate and, in our mind, orthodox." Tabba and pipe. Later in 1960, lamenting how Bampton still, uh, sorry, 1860, still uh, obstinately persists in employing a squeaking fiddle instead of the more legitimate tabba and pipe, notwithstanding what had been said respecting it and considerably marred by the effect of the whole. Technically, although it seemed unlikely to the init uninitiated that a three hold instrument could have a range of more than four notes. A good pipe with a good player could easily trill out an octave and a half, which comfortably com encompasses most of the Cotswold Morris repertoire. And with the right combination, two octaves could be achieved. The right hand ostensibly has the simplest of tasks, um, namely to beat a drum. But when you compare this dexterity required from both hands to play, say, a chromatic accordion or a finger pick guitar, the tabra has a much easier job. The melody was high and could be heard above the hubbub of the crowd, and it served to phrase the dance, prodding the memory for which figure or chorus was next. However, the right hand element of the combination was that that delivered what the dancer required most from a musician, the ability to tell him when to hit the ground and land. It was the essential communication tool throughout the set. Uh, Joseph Stafford of Headington commented on how the drum kept pretty well in with the steps. 
And Chandler makes the assumption that this meant that the tabra played a beat as the dancer made each step, but not on the hops. And this occurs exactly with the tabering practice across Europe, as we've discovered from people like Carlos Mass, playing the footfalls. Uh, the pipe and tabber in its main surviving continental forms, the Chistu and Chirula, Flavio Bombo, Galobe and Tambran, for instance, are played in the same way for many and varied dance steps in their traditions. A tradition of playing for dance continuously since the 15th century when it was the primary dance instrument in the courts of Europe. Uh, Chandler notes that as far as the dancers were concerned, the tune was subservient to the rhythm. And it's not for nothing that we are called tabarers rather than pipers. Cecil Sharp noted that many old Morris men have told us they gave up dancing when the pipe and tabba was superseded by the fiddle because they found it impossible to dance to the latter. Um, and it's a pity that of all the original dancers that were met in the great days of collecting, not one tabra was recorded on a, ta a tape or wire machine. Joe Pole of Bucknell was the last surviving tabra, but several of the fiddlers could also play pipe and tabba, including William Hathaway and Charles Benfield. That isn't to say they didn't try to record. Joe Powell could no longer play a pipe, and one of the collectors bought him a pipe to demonstrate, but he could not play it. Um, I'll skip out the next bit, which is all stuff to do with that. Um, the Bledington Young Collins collected from uh, Charles Benfield is in an unusual mode. Uh, played very, <clears throat> it plays very easily on a tabber pipe, but unusual. The A music is played without taking the thumb off. And this could be because he had a somewhat different pipe that he was playing um, that might have been a TTT -T or a TT and three quarters instead of the TTS pipe. Um, we do have recordings of several source players on fiddle. Um, Charlie Wells from Bampton, uh, Sam Bennett of Ilmington, John Robbins of Bidford, and my favorite, uh, Stephen Baldwin of Clifford's Mean. To the modern ear, uh, the recordings uh, may sound a bit primitive, lacking tone or technique, but as Chandler points out, rhythm was accent accented often at the expense of tonal purity. Bertie Clark's style at Bampton was described as almost a succession of grunts and squeals welded together by a wealth of blue notes into a wildly rhythmic pattern. Yet he is now to have, he's known to have been play, uh, trained as a classical violinist. All of that uh, roughness was in his attempt to get the rhythm out of the instrument. At times they experiment by having a drum or a tambourine played along with the fiddle in an attempt to um, reproduce the all important rhythmic qualities formed by the tabor. However, the cost of paying two musicians two musicians proved uneconomic. I learned to play, um, oh, uh, let's we go. There's Jinky Wells we were talking about. Let's have a listen to Jinky. <laughs> Put your thumbs up if you can hear him. So that sounds quite, quite rough. He was playing for dancing and he really did emphasize the, um, uh, the rhythm there. Um, so I started with Pipe and Tabba back in 1972, I think. Um, and uh, not long after I started playing the concertina and I took my inspiration for the concertina from William Kimber here in the uh, Headington Morris. And um, William Kimber, a uh, traditional musician, and he also emphasized the footfall beat. Uh, 
So this is a single step tune. And, oops, oh, and he emphasizes the, uh, uh, the footfalls rather than the hops. And if we can see on this um, thing here, uh, his uh, emphasis is on the, uh, the first and third beats of the bar. If we go back to um, uh, the theme collected in the 18th, uh, 19th century, we've got a double step here and the strikes are on the footfalls and a pause on the hop. And the same with William Kimber. However, if you look at uh, modern musicians today, uh, modern technique, particularly with a melodeon, is to play the umpa, umpa, bass chord, bass chord uh, thing, which actually puts the heavy weight on the hop and not the emphasis on the step. So there's quite a difference between uh, the traditional methods and the modern methods. It's quite clear in the uh, uh, traditional methods that rhythm was king. Uh, now let's just um, uh, have a look at, um, I'm going to skip a little bit here and move on. So we're going to look at the revival here. Um, Cecil Sharp did a lot of collection and um, I'll go back there and was well acquainted with pipe and tabba. He wasn't enamored with the instrument. He observed of the tunes we have noted down from the fiddlers only a few are being capable of being played on the ancient, more ancient instrument. Which is something I would uh, argue with because we found that the traditional tunes can all be played on the pipe and tabba. And uh, maybe the pipe and tabba that he were familiar with were not particularly well made. Um, I mentioned before that a good pipe uh, could uh, give you two octaves and an ordinary pipe could easily play an octave and a half. And uh, so uh, very few tunes need to be altered or folded to fit the instrument. A few uh, people have noted how beautifully the collected tunes fit the instrument, indicating that perhaps the instrument was instrumental in the selection of the tunes. Tunes like Lumps of Plum Pudding and Dearest Dickie uh, just fall out of the pipe, tabo pipe, despite their large range. I asked Keith Chandra about those two tunes in particular, and he traced them back to the Dorr family of Tabarers. Uh, Sharp and his friends, however, did promote the pipe and tabba, and people like Mary Neal and Helen Kennedy were proficient on the instrument. It appears often in photos of Sharp and early revivalists dancing to the whittle and dub. Now, to please Andy here, we're going to focus on Cambridge. <laughs> um, the university was significant loci in the early revival, and in particular, there were many members of the Travelling Morris founded in 19, which was founded in 1924. Um, many of the members came from Cambridge and particularly Cambridge University. Um, and uh, they formed a, a group, many formed a group called the Travelling Morris. And Travelling Morris um, uh, went out and danced in the traditional places and collected tunes. Um, one of the Travelling Morris men, uh, a soil scientist by the name of Kenworthy Schofield, proposed they form the Cambridge Morris Men, which was originally conceived as a dining club to uh, discuss Morris matters but soon was performing around the area. Members included uh, Kenworthy, Joseph Needham, Arthur Peck, Nicholas Probin, um, and in fact, uh, Schofield on the pipe and tabba, Peck, Probin, and Needham are shown in this photo. Um, Schofield is the one with the pipe and tabba. <clears throat> uh, Schofield was a Cambridge soil scientist and um, uh, and uh, a Morris dancer and a Tabra. And he became the second squire of the ring in 1936. A few years earlier, Schofield was invited um, on an EFDSS, English folk dance, sorry, EFDS, 
English Folk Dance Society tour in the Basque Country, led by Mary Neal and Arthur Peck. And there he is, that's Schofield. And uh, this is a photo from the uh, Basque tour. And here you can see them dancing in the Basque Country. And here you can see uh, Schofield um, dancing in the Basque country and he's wearing a Basque berry and he's playing a Basque taba. And uh, this, he brought, he was so enamored with the taba pipe and the taba, the Basque uh, chistu and the taba, um, that he actually brought a pair of these back with him to, uh, to England. And thereafter um, he switched to playing the deep taba and that, te that taba still exists which is quite different from the traditional narrow English taba. Uh, he was very taken by uh, the Basque traditions. Uh, they wore similar costume, white, bells, ribbons. They danced to pipe and taba. Um, and he particularly liked the construction of their taba pipe and the lower tones. Most of our pipes were short D pipes and the, this chistu played on a lower tone is much stronger sound than the high English D pipe. And um, perhaps it appealed to Schofield's aesthetic tendencies. Perhaps it looked more like Thomas Sly's long instrument from the woodcut with Will Kemp. Um, <clears throat> Schofield had a post at Rothamsted, a agricultural research establishment, Harpenden, and he joined uh, St. Albans Morris and he persuaded a friend, David Taylor, to make him a brass pipe of similar dimensions to the, the Basque pipe. And so he had a, a brass tabor pipe uh, that played as an English tabor pipe, um, and he played that with his deep drum. In St Albans, there were a number of dancers keen to learn and play, um, fascinated by Schofield's instruments. However, Schofield wasn't in the business of making instruments, but he did allow them to make measurements. And uh, St Albans team member Bill Warder took up the challenge. He made a frame to construct deep tabbers and started experimenting with brass tubing. Um, and several more pipers uh, started to uh, play a similar uh, setup. Now, here's a, a clip of Ken Worthy playing. What I'll ask you to listen out to is his very uh, brisk, strict, strict tempo, which um, is quite at odds with the kind of uh, uh, way they played in the earlier historical recordings. You'll also know that he's not playing a definite beat per foot type approach, a uh, foot forward. He's playing a pattern and he developed a specific pattern. And this approach and this pattern um, uh, uh, was picked up by the other members of St Albans uh, Morris. And here is uh, Mike Chandler, um, a good old friend of mine, with his. Uh, Jim Jones pipe. Uh, Jim took over pipe making from Bill Warder and made them in uh, stainless steel and he's playing there Schofield's original uh, Basque Tabber. Schofield died in 1960 but he had kicked off quite an important revival of the pipe and tabber. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't the biggest thing that was happening in Morris music. The fiddle was still in there. The concertina was popular, but in 1960s, early 60s, Peter Kennedy visited the Hohner factory in Germany and suggested that they made a melodeon in G and D rather than C and F, because he thought there would be a good market for it in, uh, in the UK. Um, <clears throat> now I'd like now to switch to um, another Cambridge musician, Russell Wortley. Uh, Russell was younger than Schofield by 11 years and uh, was a Cambridge uh, soil, well, agri 
agricultural science, plant physiology scientist concerned with the potato virus. Um, he was also a member of Travelling Morris and he was active in collecting. He focused on the Flight of Dean dances and recorded Stephen Baldwin and Beatrice Hill at uh, Bromsborough Heath. A light Schofield, he took up the pipe and tabba, but unlike Schofield, he didn't invent his own style. He researched how the old guys did, uh, how they played. He collected tunes, dances and songs, but more importantly, he collected technique. Um, and um, he was able to, um, uh, it's one thing to be able to play a tune to listen to and beat in time with it, but it's a different thing uh, to play directly for dancers. And um, they did something very specific, those old tabras. They watched the lead, lead dancer. And so he developed uh, the same style. And uh, he was very uh, specific. I went to a workshop with him and he told me to watch the lead dancer and play for their footfalls. And so uh, that would mean that it'd be quite often a non-linear rhythm. Double step is not an exact six, four or four, four. It's micro dotted. And when a dancer does a feet together jump, they're in the air for longer than a beat. So the tempo actually changes within the bar. In order to make notation, Sharp wrote in straight common time signatures. But the reality for Wortley was a symbiotic interplay between dancer and music by playing for the lead dancer especially playing for jig, uh, a, a dancer playing in a, for a jig. In the light of this knowledge, I'd like to repeat Jinky Wells' memories. They used to play much slower on the whistle and dub, but it was beautiful. You could grasp every moment. The old style of dancing was much best, and it's a pity the much loved whistle and dub couldn't be brought back. There were significant differences between Schofield and Wortley schools of tabbering, and these were very apparent to me uh, when I started learning in the 1970s. My role models were Mike Chandler, Bert Cleaver, Graham Lyndon Jones, all were straight down the Schofield player, Schofield technique of deep tabber, G pipe, um, playing a pattern. By contrast, when I went to workshops in Cambridge with Russell Wortley, I learned to watch the dancer and play exactly to his feet. Wortley realized that if the pipe and tabber was to continue, then people needed an instrument to be, make, to be easy available, to rectify the lack of instruments in the, sixth, uh, the 19th century. He persuaded Boozy and Hawks to make a variation of their ubiquitous D tin whistle, the generation tabber, uh, the generation tabber pipe, which is still available today, uh, a fine instrument for dance, a real instrument for only £9.99. Um, but if you think it's too shrill, then you're missing the point. The pipe and tabber is our last remaining outdoor instrument tradition. It isn't meant to be played indoors. Whereas Schofield had reinvented the tabber pipe and brought in the, the deep tabber, um, he inspired the pipe and tabber revolution in the 20th century. It was Wortley that brought us uh, a taste of the 19th century in terms of technique. If we roll on now 45, 46 years and look at the Morris scene now, there are very few tabras left of the two schools. The Schofield pattern is still discernible. There are still players who swear by the Jim Jones stainless steel G pipe and deep tabba as a traditional Morris instrument. There are but a handful of Wortley school tabras, notably, notably those who came up through the Cambridge Morris men like Andy. However, there are plenty of good musicians who can play a strict tempo for Morris, um, somewhat akin to the Schofield approach on a whole variety of instruments. But there are also a number of musicians that Wortley would appreciate and identify with, especially for jigs. For me, it is a joy to see the likes of Mark Rogers, Richard Arrowsmith, Johnny Spears, Will Pound, all absolutely nailing it, playing for athletic jig dancers. Um, to see Richard uh, Arrowsmith playing for Pexerton, he and his instrument dance every microsecond of the way. Mary Jo Searle of New Esperance is a phenomenal musician in the mold of Mary Neal and Russell Wortley. I hear the beat of her tabba and she is absolutely clear what she is doing. 
so many of the musicians today that you come across when you just see a Morris side out, really, I don't think do know what they're doing. They're quite happy to get a tune. They have no concept that, that there are different schools of uh, playing. They've just taught themselves. And I'm sure they've had no, no knowledge of the names of Wortley and Schofield. Um, so I've nearly finished now. Um, uh, St Albans and Cambridge uh, used to have the convention of only one musician playing at a time, uh, so that musicians uh, had to pick up the method by osmosis. Um, is one method better than the other? They both give a good performance. I'm really biased. I, I definitely prefer the Wortley tradition, uh, but I can see some very neat uh, sides dancing to a strict tempo. Um, however, I often see terrible music um, played on all kinds of instruments. Uh, last summer, I went to watch a side that I used to dance and play for. There was a row of nine melodians and concertinas. As they got too old to dance, they would take up the melodion, and if they were happy to remember the tune all the way through without a mistake, they were winning. The left hand holds the bass and chord buttons down, the bellows go in and out, volume is a thing, no definable rhythm, either Schofield or Wortley style. The tune is smeared up and down the line because the man at the left hand end is playing faster than the one at the right hand end, and they can't hear each other. None of them are looking at the dancers. I turned away. A few seconds later, the dance fell apart in confusion. The dancers didn't know where they were. There we go. <laughs> oh. Perhaps if I can, un, um, whoops. Oh, oh, what have I done? I've just removed somebody, I think. Unmute. As, as chairman of this session. Are you there, Bill? Bill, you're muted. We can't hear a word you're saying. Hang on, no, you probably can now. Yeah. But okay, uh, th I mean, thank you first of all for that, that really quite inspiring talk, Steve. Um, I think we have a few minutes for, for questions. Uh, can anybody either push them through on the chat facility and uh, hope that Steve see what we have? Yeah, we've got half a dozen uh, uh, okay. people on the, um, on the uh, oh, we've got Q&A coming up. Uh-huh. No, that's... There's a question from Catherine Wheeler, Stephen. Yeah. Um, is the pipe and tabor only associated with Cotswold, or is there evidence of it being played for other Morris or other folk dancing in the UK? Um, you do uh, come across um, uh, references to it in other folk dances, um, but really quite definitely, and Bill would probably be able to answer this uh, more exactly uh it's much more important in the early music isn't it bill yes yes so if you you're looking at bass dances and the box and things like that you'll find uh, you'll find uh, uh tablas uh and you see uh iconography in the 15th 16th century of uh dancers with a tabla playing yeah um it is gradually being taken up by dance groups, uh, groups who are specializing in early dance, not necessarily Morris. Um, particularly in Eastern Europe, there, there was a strong school of playing for, for uh, early historical dance in Russia, Slovenia, places like that. And a little bit in this country, less so in North America. I, I mean, if we, if we um, Angel, um, perhaps you could say something. The, the, the Flavio Bombo, which is pipe and tabla in Spain, uh, in Catalonia, is, is, uh, is used for quite a lot of dances, isn't it? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the, the question, please? Yes, so in, in Catalonia, the Flavio Bombo is, yes. is popular for a wide variety of dances. Yes, yeah, it is. Uh, you can hear it in, with giants, with Valle Bastons, that it's Morris dance and many other many other things it's very usual yeah yeah uh, I've, I've i've seen people dancing um uh, uh couple dances to it as well 
and sardanas as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, but sardanas is a different tradition because uh, Florian makes a, a, a very special paper in the in the interpretation of the, of the dance. Yeah. So, uh, we, we can see uh, the Chardana Flaviol and the popular Flaviol then make dance, uh, Jay and uh, many other things. But in essence, the, the instrument is the same. It's the same for Chardana and for Flaviol. But the, the drum, the tower for Chardana is very small. Very small and makes some some sticks uh, for a few moments, not, not more. It's a very bright sound, isn't it? Tick, 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 tick. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yeah. And um, also, uh, we've got in the, um, uh, where uh, in Portugal, you have uh, dance traditions to the pipe and tabba and other parts of Spain, and also the Basque country, very, very popular. Anyway, we've got uh, other questions here. Um, uh, Chris Walker, hello, Chris. Um, uh, Chris is. Uh, where, where have we got? Where have we got? Let's let's we'll go back to this thing. Um, so Chris is asking. Um, um, when did the high pipe replace the larger pipe shown in earlier pictures? Um, so, well, that's quite interesting. We've got longer pipes in um, some of the early Morris and Moresk pictures. They're quite long pipes. And uh, you get the high pipe coming in. The earliest example I believe we have is the Chipping Camden pipe. And then it's the, it's the high pipe you get right way through the 19th century. Bill. Yeah, just to follow up on that, uh, it was what you mentioned earlier that the high pipe is ideal for out of doors. Yeah. And of course, a lot of those early moresques, moriscos were danced inside, indoors, and um, where the, the longer pipe might have been preferable. And I think that is still the case. That... Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think that's notable when we're in um, Catalonia. The flaviol is a very high pipe, isn't it, uh, Angel? Yes, it is. It's very, very high and very low. One of the things I, I noticed in a procession in uh, Catalonia, there'll be thousands of people in the streets. You can hear a pipe and tabba above the sound of uh, the, the crowd. Mm. Yes. Whereas when we took part in one of those processions, Gwilym will, rem will remember this, uh, in Villanova, the, uh, uh, we had quite a few melodians. You couldn't hear the melodians, but you could hear the one pipe and tabba. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, a, another question there was, uh, do we have a recording of Kenworthy Schofield? And um, I would like to play, play one of those. Question was, have we got any recordings of Russell Wortley? Yes, yes, we do have recordings of Russell Wortley. Here we go, is, a, is um, Russell Wortley and Andy Richards. Is that just Russell? Uh, that's, that's me. In, you can't hear me dancing, but I, I had to dance for him while he played it. So he could you can hear the one, two, three, one, two, three beat of the double step. One, two, three, one, two, three. So yes, uh, yes, we do have um, uh, Russell Wortley recordings and you can uh, find them um, from uh, the Morris Ring. They have a whole set of CDs and I think you can download them as well. Um, so uh, we've got questions coming through thick and fast here. Um, uh, oh, 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 what have we got here? Do you, do you want me to read these out, Stephen, or can you see them okay? Good idea if you can read them out. Can we put you, can we make you, uh, <laughs> we make you live as well, Jez, um, visually? There we go, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So, a quick question from me. So, we, we've talked about all the Cotswold tunes and the current selection. Do we know what they were playing for Morris before then? 
Well, that's really interesting. Um, so most of the tunes that we know, uh, you know, the majority of the tunes come from the 18th century and we're able to track them back to tunes related to pleasure gardens and the operas and the, uh, the music hall. Uh, there aren't many really old tunes that come through. But if you look in old collections, you find tunes that are called something Morris, a Morris, a something Morris. You find a lot of tunes called a Scotch Morris, um, but we don't know whether that actually relates to any kind of dance that anybody did. Um, but uh, you do find these tunes called, called a something Morris, yeah. I think the one tune that goes back to the 16th century is, is Greensleeves, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. Written in 1580. Uh, or published in 1580 and being played, still being played today for Cotswold Morris. Yeah. yeah so there's, that, also, there's also Stain, Stains Morris and uh, and there's the uh, the Moresque tune as well. Although I, I don't know, I discount those. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Stains Morris, um, I don't think was used traditionally for Morris until it was picked up by um, Darcy Ferris and, and Bidford. To my oh, okay. knowledge, mm -hmm. he, he revived it then. Mm. So I just came to that one. And similarly, the Morisco uh, only occurs in the Headington uh, tradition. And I I suspect that came in through somebody it's like in, Percy it's Manning. In, it's in Bidford as well. Yeah, yeah I, but again, yeah. Uh, the, the Bidford um, is, is a mixture of revived tunes and collected tunes and i yeah, suspect yeah. that morisco was a revived tune i think so uh, one, yeah one of the things about the morisco is that um this terminology thing that morisco doesn't necessarily mean to do with morris it could mean morisco as in uh a moor that converted to christianity Right, but we know that that tune does date back to 1588, and, oh, and, yeah. it, is a, and it is a Morris dance tune in 1588 in Arvo's orchestrography. Ah, right. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> so Mary, Mary Jo had a question. So she was asking about the, uh, the tabra in the Dixton Harvesters, um, and uh, she's noting it seems to have a medium-sized pipe. Is that a B-flat, perhaps? Well... Um, first thing I say is, does it matter? <laughs> because um, all of these uh, early depictions of Morris, the musician is playing on his own. And so, um, you know, it, it doesn't matter what he plays in. Uh, the one, the pipe that he's got is the one. So, yes, it, it, the, the, the Dixon Tabra is really interesting because um, uh, he appears as a... A silhouette and it's like he's stamped all over the oh no the Dixon one that's one no, it, yes the Dixon one that's right he's stamped all over the painting um sometimes in reverse um and it's it's quite a, it's like um it's like a logo it's like a tabara logo and if i had thought about it i might have uh, chosen that for the tts logo instead of the, the <laughs> the drawing, uh, the drawing I did from Gloucester, <laughs> but yeah, it, it 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 it's with all these things we uh, we do look at them and say, is this an artistic license or is it um, uh, um, uh, yeah, is it an artistic license or is it also I I think uh, in the Cotswolds um, I I live about two, two miles from Dixton Hill by the way. Um, I think in the Cotswolds, the, the bulk of the evidence is that most people played a, a D pipe, a high D pipe. So, you know, you, you don't sort of find B flat pipes. Yeah. So I agree with Steve there. And, um, but I think the Dixon harvesters, that was 17, well, I can't remember the date. Um, About 1710, I think, isn't it? Yeah. 1710, 1710. We, we may well still have been in the long longer pipe mode at that time. Okay. Chris Walker was asking, was the Chipping Camden pipe in high D and was it a TTS pipe? Uh, ah, ah, we, we need, we need, where, where's Richard Sermon when you need him? Richard <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> uh, noted the tonalities of all of the historic pipes. 
<clears throat> and their fingering systems. Uh, I seem to remember that it is a TTS. Uh, there is an interesting thing in the historic pipes that have been measured. Most of them are TTS. And then you get um, these odd TT and three quarters. By TTS, I mean tone, tone, semitone, as you lift the fingers off the, the holes. <coughs> and the thumb hole is a bit variable on some of them. And you get this thing called a tone, tone, three quarters. And Joe Pohl's pipe was like this. And you had to pinch the thumb hole to get an accurate note, um, which is probably why he couldn't play uh, uh, the pipe that was given to him by Russell Wortley when he, uh, Russell wanted to uh, record some tunes for him because um, it didn't work if you pinched it. Yeah, Joe Powers was more Galibay tuning, wasn't it? Very uh, interesting. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was T, T and three quarters, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just on the housekeeping point, Stephen, all of the presentations, can we go back to those in the future? Uh, we can um, put that... Um, we can leave this. Um, I think it's it's still recording. Yes, it's recording. So we can put it up. And uh, it can actually stay on the YouTube. Yeah. As it would be wonderful to go back to some of those illustrations and spend more time on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on that, Steve, and, and um, the rest of the pres presenters, should we move on to the next one? Um, it, it, it would be the case that assuming uh, the, the recording of this will be available, uh, you will still be able to take questions on any of the details within the, the, the program by email or something. So many thanks to Steve for that excellent presentation. A lot of, a lot of very valuable information in that, in that piece. So thank you, Steve. Um, moving on, our next speaker is Gwilym. Willem Davies, and Willem's talk is on the business, the Cotswolds, a mysterious tune from the, the myster equally mysterious Cotswolds. Um, Willem, you've been a member of the, uh, the Noble Society of Taborers for many, many years. Oh, yes. I know that your interests range all over the, all over the globe, and you've dug out Taborers from most surprising parts. But well, uh, uh, northern history. Portugal, I found a lot. Anyway, I'll hand over to you, yeah. and we'll hear about the mysterious events in the Cotswolds. Okay, right. Well, hello, hello everybody. I'm going to talk about this um, curious Morris tune, which, which poses several questions. But the answer to all these questions is, I don't know, or I have no idea. So let's see if we can hear what the tune is for a start. If I can share screen, if I got that facility. No, I haven't. I have to be enabled to share screen, please. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Hang on. Tell me when. You are enabled. So I am. Right. OK. Let's have a look then. And uh, we'll get the PowerPoint up. Ubiquitous PowerPoint. We'll put on share computer sound. And we'll start it at from the beginning. From, yeah, from the beginning. There we are. An unknown Morris tune. Okay, let's see. So let's hear what the tune is, shall we? Um, this is me playing it. See if you know what this is. <laughs> strange tune and have a look at this uh, the maid of the mill the writing's terrible I know noted down from a pipe and tabor player at Oxford June 1901 
um, immediately this should raise some questions in your mind. So let's unpick it a bit. The maid of the mill in, in various uh, variations is a well-known Cotswold Morris tune. Cecil Sharp found various different versions. He found about six or seven. Uh, the, perhaps the most typical is the one he noted from um, Henry Taylor, who played for the Longborough Morris. A little bit faded, but you can see there. Uh, oh, sorry, is it Henry Taylor or Harry Taylor? I'm not quite sure. Anyway, and he noted that in 1910. Henry, Henry Taylor. I've got it wrong at the top. Never mind. Uh, um, and he's written down the dance steps as well. Now that Morris tune or variations of it will be known to quite a lot of Cotswold Morris musicians, something like this. <laughs> be familiar to people that tune or to, to Morris musicians anyway um, the tune made of the mill has been associated with Morris from the late 18th century um, what's its origin well it was used in an opera William Shields 1780 opera called Rosina as a song uh, the maid of the mill is a very fine girl etc but maybe older we're not sure the maid of the mill was a sort of phrase that was bandied about and you will see that the tune used in the opera is very close to that played by Henry Taylor but nothing like our mystery tune now with any luck I might be able to hum this to you goes down there Something like that, anyway. And you will hear that's very close to uh, Henry Taylor's version. Now, where did that tune... Who wrote down that tune? Well, it was a gentleman, Frank Kitson. This raises more questions. Uh, Frank was a... He was born in Leeds. He was a North Country man. He worked as an antique collector. And his interests brought him into collecting collections of songs and tunes. And this led him on to a fascination for folk music collecting. And he traveled to many locations to meet performers and to note down their particularly songs. And his collecting, including that made at the mill, can be seen on the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library website under their Digital Tradition program. Um, however, he didn't really come much south of the wash, so far as I can see, and his, his main collecting was around Yorkshire, and that's what he was noted for. There's little evidence that he ever did any serious collecting in, in Oxfordshire. Uh, so this scrap of manus manuscript throws up several unanswered questions. The most important one would be who the unidentified tabarrow was. And only a couple of the traditional tabarrows were alive in 1901. There was Joe Powell of Bucknell, and we saw a photo of Joe just now. And he played Maid of the Mill, but quite a different tune. And in a version much more in line with the other Cotswold ones. The other um, Tabra who was around, and he lived in 1940, was Thomas Pitts. Thomas Pitts played for the Sherborne side, and so far as we know, their repertoire didn't include Made of the Mill. Um, he was, Thomas Pitts was visited by the Travelling Morris in about 1927, and gave them several tunes, but not Made of the Mill. Um, besides, I feel it's unlikely that, 
likely that Kidson would have met him. And if Kidson was a, a serious folk music collector, why didn't Kidson note down the name of this, uh, of this taberer? It's quite important for us to know. A bit late to ask him now. Kidson wrote the tune in B flat. Uh, well, why? This would imply either a very large or a very small tabor pipe. And again, if it was a Cotswold tune, it was more likely played on a D pipe in the key of G. So that's my speculation. So I said, as I said at the beginning, this tune raises more questions than it answers. Uh, I'm willing to take questions, so long as questioners are prepared for the answer to be, I have no idea. But just to remind you what that tune sounds like. That's it. Frank. <laughs> Morris tune collected by Frank Hudson, 1901. Okay, I'll stop the share now then. There we go. There we go. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bill, Bill, hang on. We need to unmute Bill. Uh -huh. So, so Gwilym, can I ask what your connection is with the tune? Why, why? Are you particularly fascinated by this one? Well, I've, I've just got in a, a, a curious mind that likes to winkle out these little bits and pieces, I think. And uh, I'm interested in Morris tunes and their provenance. And that one just uh, stuck out like a sore thumb because it didn't fit any of the other sort of patterns we know of, of sort of Morris tunes. Uh, Gwilym, you you mentioned that um, there was a, in fact there was a you, you mentioned the opera. There was a very well known comic opera called The Maid of the Mill, um, yeah. late eighteenth century. I can't I can't remember the exact date, but it may have been that one, that it was simply one of the tunes from the Maid of the from the opera, which wouldn't necessarily have been called that, but may have later acquired the name simply by virtue of its connection with the opera. Yeah. It was apparently the, the most... I think oh, check that out. Uh, I think there were several... Come on. Well, it, it could be. I don't know. I haven't checked that out, but... Uh, yeah, you haven't... requires further research, I think. Yeah, I think the score, anyway, is online on the IMSLP website. Yeah. So you, you perhaps might go through the score and see if you, that was where that's where I would begin actually, because yeah, yeah. apparently the most one of the most performed, if not the most performed opera in the, the late eighteenth century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it could easily have been picked up somewhere from there and then acquired the name. But I don't know I don't know the tune at all. Okay. So Chris Walker's just pointing out the, the difference in the time signatures as well. So made of the mill in in six a, but but not the mystery tune. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm... Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, one other thing I would say is well, that well, Kidson uh, wrote it down in two four. I did try playing it in six eight, and it sounded quite good in six eight. <laughs> I, I can see the I can see the similarities with uh, say the Ilmington made of the mill. Um, but you know, it's it's like it's from the same family of tunes, but it's not the same tune. Hmm. Uh, Ter Terry's just wondering if the writer uh, misremembered the title. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Frank Kidson, so far as I know, wasn't an expert on uh, Cotswold Morris, um, although he was an expert on folk song. 
and I guess that he wrote down the Maid of the Mill because that's what the Tabra told him it was called. Now, mm. it's not unknown for Morris musicians, traditional Morris musicians, to confuse names of tunes. Um, and, uh, if, well, if you look at the Chipping Camden tunes, they've got different names for all the tunes that we know by other names, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I can imagine when you, when you look at... Um, uh, particularly Keith Chandler's book, uh, The Squeaking Bells and Whistles, is the, is the business of the tabras going round from side to side, playing different tunes for different sides, and then um, uh, maybe, you know, the dance they do called Made of the Mill, he said, uh, and he, does, he plays the tune that he plays for it rather than necessarily the tune that another tabra that taught them the dance played for it. You know, there's quite a lot of opportunity for, for um, uh, <laughs> confusion there. As I've just noticed Donald on, um, on the chat has said, what, Morris musicians mix up the names of tunes? <laughs> 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 yeah, well, the answer to that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just remembered playing for um, Gloucestershire at Chalford once and um, I stood up and the dancers all got their act together and they asked me, called out the tune to play and I started playing. They got halfway through the foot up and the dance fell apart. And um, they said, wrong tune, wrong tune, wrong tune. So I waited till they reformed and I started playing again and uh, they did the dance perfectly. And... Um, Somebody came up at the end and said, you played exactly the same tune <laughs> the second time as you did the first time. I said, yeah, they got the wrong dance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> okay, at that point, thank you very much, Gwilym. It's a fascinating idea. I, more research is definitely needed. It's um, something yeah. we need to inquire about. And um, I think to the audience, um, answers on a postcard, please. <laughs> Willem would love to know the source of this tune. So one thought is um, to aid in this research, if we could stick the tune up on, on the Tabor's website so that we have a record of, of it and can then uh, uh, try, and, try and trace it back. But thank you very much, Gwilym. That's great, something like that. Um, so I, my suggestion, I think on the program, we're, we're scheduled for a break at this point. And I'm just looking at the time. Um, Andy, if we, res it's now 23, 25, uh, 23 past three. If, if we resume at quarter to four, is that going to be okay? Yeah, sure. We have a short break, quarter to four, and then we'll proceed with the next series of, of talks. Okay, and I'll leave, um, so we'll leave the uh, this all running so people can, um, in fact, I would encourage uh, the attendees um, uh, to chat and um, there is a chat facility. I don't know whether the attendees, uh, we've got um, several people on the attendees list um, uh, who might be able to chat on there and um, yeah, I can see that there's some chat going on. I can, if I can <laughs> work that out. And also on YouTube, please um, continue chatting until we uh, reform. Um, yes, uh, we, I think we can chat uh, on the Zoom, um, uh, you know, between uh, attendees and, um, and panelists. Okay. Um, we'll regroup at uh, 16.45. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. 15.45. <laughs> Steve, did you say 16? 15.45. 15.45. 20 minutes. <laughs>
Happy with that, uh, Stephen. That's looking very good. That's looking very good. Yeah. And um, uh, sorry to everybody about the uh, situation with the YouTube having to shift. If anybody on the YouTube would like to uh, join us on the Zoom, uh, I can uh, get the link for you and you can come over to the Zoom. If I can just find uh, the settings, copied the link and there we go. I was putting the kettle on, which is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stephen, I, from your presentation, I think there's precedent for for reconstituting ourselves as a dining club. Would you would you be up for that? <laughs> yeah, I quite like the idea of that. Uh, yeah. Is that something we could maybe raise at the AGM? We'll yeah, see yeah. how that goes down. <laughs> the Tabra, uh, the Tabra Society Dining Club. <laughs> Uh, Steve, I, I have just a question for you. Yeah. Uh, maybe when you start the, my video of my paper, I, I must go because uh, my children must go to another side. All right. I must bring them uh, there. Is it a problem? Uh, no, I think we can do that. The the um the video was very quiet. Very quiet. Yeah. So I'm not sure um, we'll all be able to hear it. Um, yeah. So um, I had rather been hoping you would be able to to um, to to actually speak it rather than use the video. Would that well, be? A, um, is that difficult? No problem. I, I can read again the the paper. Yeah. Is, is, is you sure that's okay? Well. I, I will do it, but I, I'm not sure to, to stay here when I, when I stop it. So should we um, see if we can swap you around so you could um, possibly uh, swap with um, Andy or Bill? So you go earlier. You you can be earlier. Uh, no, 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 never mind. I, um, I, think, I, I can agree. I think that'd be a good thing to do if so that you, we can do that. Let's, um, Bill's disappeared. And so is and Andy. <laughs> uh, um, I, I'll see if I can um, uh, get them. Um, no, no, never mind. I, uh, I'm sure I we will read the, pa the paper. It's, there's no problem. That would be that would be a lot better. It was a bit too quiet to, to hear. Uh, okay. Um, no problem, Steve. Let me just. Um, yeah, I t I, we did try it. Um, we did an experiment. We tried it the other day. It was a bit a bit quiet. Oh, in fact, too quiet. Uh, people couldn't hear it. So, I, I am sorry. Yeah. No worries, no worries. Um, let me just... Um, don't know what's happening here. My... Um, my... Uh, my cursor. <laughs> I can't see my cursor. <laughs> how do I deal with that? I don't know. Willem, how do you do? It's a long time ago we spoke. Yes, how are you, Angel? I'm just fine, thanks. And you? <laughs> oh, multi. Multi. Hello, Angel. Hey. <laughs> Good to see how you. How do you do? Yes. <laughs> is your family well? Yes, they are. Thank you. Get uh, growing. They, growing. They are about growing. to arrive from school. <laughs> ah, growing. We have grandchildren now. Yeah. Yes. Some of us have boilers. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> How many grandsons do you have? Uh, we've got um, four grandchildren. One grandson. Grandchildren, yeah. sorry. Three granddaughters, yeah. yes. Four. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> wow. One boy, three girls. Uh, maybe in a few minutes you, you can see my children now. Oh, they are, good. They are about to arrive from school. 
nice. I was hoping we'd get uh, a guest from Ecuador popping in, but uh, it doesn't seem to have turned up. Yeah. I've, I've been talking to Alberto. And yeah. You have, have you? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, he's not, um, he's, uh, I don't think he's joining us now. Okay. Well, I think the time difference is difficult for him, yeah. probably. Yes, it's yeah. about seven hours difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is Alberto there? Is Alberto listening in on that? We, can't, we can't see who's... Um, I, no, we can't see who's um, on, the, um, on the YouTube. Um, oh, on the YouTube. So on YouTube, we've got 19 people. And we've had, um, we've had um, uh, a number of people... Uh, we've had six people on the Zoom. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. Um, so um, uh, that's good. So, did you manage to get photos of the Dixon Tabras? Tabras? No, and the museum's closed at the moment. But uh, I, yeah, it's yes. But the 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 Tabras are very small on that picture compared with the size of the picture aren't they really yeah, yeah. and as you say they're only in silhouette but i do have a contact who works at the museum mm -hmm. and i've asked her uh, but uh, she says oh yeah she'll go in sometime and take photos for me so that would be good but uh unless you've got any <laughs> well i think i have i think we're on film yeah but uh, i mean google hasn't got any no um, not, not usable. Now maybe we can go and um, uh, um, we can uh, maybe we can get um, uh, yeah get some because I've I've got um, I've got quite a good camera I could get some really good shots on it. Um, it's very dimly lit, uh, but um, uh, I think I can do it <laughs> with my uh, internal camera stabilization. <laughs> And a steady arm. <laughs> <laughs> Bill? Yes, Steve. Um, Angel has to go and do child duties. Um, oh. could, he, um, could he swap with, um, with Andy, perhaps, and go straight after the break? Yes, an excellent idea. So if, if, if Angel starts at quarter two, as we said, that's fine. Then followed by Andy, and then I'll take up the last slot. That's fine. Is that is that okay, Angel? Uh, so, if I understood, uh, it's me the, the first to speak now. Spot on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's no problem. That'd be great. Thank, thank you very much. No, that's it's it's perfectly fine. Um, uh, and I think uh, um, Steve, you're going to do the introductions, aren't you? Uh, am I? Uh, that's right. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a few minutes left that we'll, we'll keep it going. Yeah, and um, no, that's good. So, uh, Steve, uh, will you read the, my presentation, uh, the one I sent you? So, well, it's I'm, me. It's you, it's you, yeah. Oh, okay. It's you, it's you, yeah. And, uh, and that would be, that would be good. Um, yeah, so anyway, how's things in, in, um, in Cambrils at the moment? For the moment, it's a rainy day. Oh, yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> this, morning, sunshine, yeah? this morning we had a, a storm. Oh. It's usual in yeah. in September here, uh, and we are mm, with the problem of the the COVID, mm, like everybody. It's it's all all very strange. Uh, so, I, how about the um, uh, festa majeure? in different towns because i see yeah. some videos of some things happening only videos uh, a few a few shows but for example uh, every year uh, on this date i i have made uh, more or less uh, 40, uh, 40 sorry okay, carry on carry on i i played 40 times in a on a year this yeah. year i played Eight times. Yeah, yeah. It's awful. Yeah. Uh, people, the uh, musicians are, are very hungry. 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, it's such a part of the way of life in, in the towns in Catalonia to, yeah. uh, to, to have these, uh, these processions. Um, I, I think uh, you know people listening might not realize that uh, your dances, your traditional dances, are mostly dance on fiesta days, uh, which are the the, the patronal um, church day, aren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I'm, uh, I really love seeing those. You know, they're just a fantastic event, and uh, I wish we still had that. <laughs> but. Um, yeah. I wish we still had that tradition, <laughs> but uh, we had uh, we had the Reformation and we lost all of that. <laughs> yeah. It's the <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a pity there. So, um, <clears throat> so I saw one or two uh, special performances uh, that um, I think. Um, Oh, we, <laughs> we got a shot of Bill here. <laughs> um, uh, one or two special performances of um, uh, some of the the giants and uh, uh, some of the the beasts performing in churches uh, on the Saints' Day on Delia. I saw one particular one of um, an Legla uh, dancing for the for the Legla. Yeah. You see. <laughs> Yeah, I can't remember where. I think it was, um, it might have been a video that um, Paquita put up. Paquita, yes. Yeah. Paquita Roch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, still, anyway. Yeah, so it's a great, it's a great uh, uh, interruption to, you know, that, that, mm. the, those traditions. Um, yes, pa Paquita is a great researcher. Yeah. A very talented one. Yeah. And his husband, Javi, of course, yeah. <laughs> he's the Pope, <laughs> almost. <laughs> the Pope of the music. <laughs> More or less. <laughs> it's yeah. a great guy. Yeah, fantastic, uh, fantastic people, yeah. Mm. Mm. So how's everyone doing? Has anybody got any beer? I can see Bill with his cup of very special. I'm, I'm here. Ready for <laughs> <laughs> it. Yeah. So you will follow follow Angel. Tell me, please. Andy, so Andy. Yeah, we did did you catch that, Andy? We're doing a, a bit of a yeah, yeah no, that's fine. Yeah. Is it gonna be, Steve, is it gonna be best? Because I I've mine mine is on a vi is in a video format. Should I play that from, from me or do you yeah, want to play yeah. it from you? Yeah. I think it'd be all right. I'll play it from me then. Fine. You're, you're, you're not um you're not trying to um uh link it from a great distance. <laughs> oh, okay. You're in you're in the known world. <laughs> well when when I start, if it all goes pear shaped, then obviously just Stop me and tell me. <laughs> Stop you and buy one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just looking at, there's quite a lot of chat going on. I've just noticed they're uh, joining us on YouTube. We've got Elizabeth Christina from oh, Washington brilliant. State. So um, must be the morning over there in Washington State. Um, yeah, uh, several from the States uh, um, joining us. Right. Uh, so, um, Jeremy is there and Donald. Um, I think they they are both on the Zoom. Uh, we've only got two attendees on the Zoom at the moment. Who is? Oh, I, I know. I know. See there. Yeah, that's good. Um, good. Yeah, some of the, the 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 whole thing about the made of the mill tune is it's it's quite a fantastic tune, isn't it? I think it's the one that the uh, the Bucknell Taborers used to traditionally they used to have a lot to drink and and that they'd be tied to the uh, the tree in front of the uh, Trigger Pond pub in Bucknell and then uh, and then whatever the dancers asked them for they would just play <laughs> play made of the mill, <laughs> 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 whichever one was asked for. 
<laughs> but also the uh, also the the Brackley made of the mills uh, a superb uh, kind of fighting dance. But it's it's um it's it's such a rhythmic tune. You could all, you could almost imagine the notes being taken out and just the whole thing being done to tabering, really. <laughs> so yeah, I, I could easily see that that working for um for the uh, the tune that Goodman. Uh, showed to us actually. Yeah, it strikes me as um, a sort of sidestep and half hay dance that rhythm, but that's just how I picture it in my mind, you know. Ah, yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. Mm. like uh, Banbury Bill or something like that. Yeah, yeah. That, that sort of thing. But anyway, well, isn't that really how um, Made of the Mill Ill Moonton? Uh, it's a linked handkerchief, but it's still it's linked handkerchief, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a set dance, it's not um, too complex, is it? Um, yeah. you haven't got corners. <laughs> yeah. Look at that guy. Hey, hello, hey, hello. hey. hey. <laughs> hey lovely to see you. He's Roger. Hello, That's hello. 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 <laughs> hello. <laughs> One over. Say hello, Roger. Hello. What's your name? What's your name? Up to the news. Roger. <laughs> hello, Roger. Paul Bay. Quantes años tienes? ¿Qué te pregunta? Quantes años tienes? Tres. Tres. Paul Bay. I am six years old. Oh, I am six. 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 Oh, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> That's a great age. <laughs> I sometimes wish I was six. <laughs> he's, he's just beginning to learn English now at the school. Uh, Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye. Pizza <laughs> <laughs> Viat. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I'm sure his English would be better than my Catalan, anyway. <laughs> Maybe a lot better than mine. My well, Catalan's very rusty. a fantastic Catalan. You know it, <laughs> Willem. I know it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I don't, I don't have any... I haven't had any practice speaking it at all recently. I can read it all right. I, I think your Catalan is better than my English one. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think your English is much, much your, your English is pretty good, actually. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, yeah. really yeah. good. Uh, I, I, I must apologize for my disastrous pronunciation. Eh? I am so uh, awfully sorry. I think it's really good. <laughs> Somebody asked me how long it takes to learn a language. And I say, well, you never learn a language. You just go on learning, you know. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're learning all the time. I, I hope to get a good grasp to it grasp of English by the time we finish. Yeah, yeah, working on English. But yeah. there again, there's, there's always new words coming up, aren't there? And uh, new ways of saying things and new slang arises. Mm. It's, not, it's not the new words coming up that worries me. It's the old words that have that I have forgotten. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. my 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 watch says a minute to go so we're, we're ready in a few minutes to... in that minute can i just say i put a question on uh, chat about the origin of tunes i'm trying to find um truncos just seems to turn up in cotswold morris I haven't found it anywhere else and orange and bloom seems to be a one-off in the sherborne tradition mm. if anybody knows any Versions of those outside Morris, I'd be interested. What on earth does trunkles mean? Mm. Trunk hose. Trunk hose, yeah. Trunk hose, yeah. Is it what you uh, wear? <laughs> well, I don't know. Yes, no, but there, no. there, there is, there, there is, there is actually, uh, there, there, there's actually, a, I think, a song that refers to, or, or um, no, I, I, I'm not sure if it's a song or, um, or somebody's collection of something but it, it in in one in one instance it, it's referred to as trunk hole and therefore is presumably 
somewhat dodgy in its meaning. Oh, <laughs> holding your trunk hose. Oh, yeah. No doubt. But, um, yes, trunk hose went out some time ago. But they were very, um, yes, that they're probably due for a comeback. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to envisage a Morris side all, all dressed in trunk hose. It could be quite spectacular. I think, is that is that the, the kind of um, uh, gear that um, uh, we saw in that that carving with the Morris man with his bottom sticking out? <laughs> it, 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 yeah, he probably had a trunk hole, I'd imagine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve, are you now on your email? On your email. Email. Email, email, account. email now, yes. I've just sent you uh, four pictures. Okay. Uh, just, uh, are you able to show it when I ask you for it? If you like, yeah. That's a good idea. Um, let me just um, save those pictures. Okay, and um, where should we put them? There are four, four pictures. Are we ready to start in a moment, are we, um, Bill? Yes, we're ready to go, Steve. Well, it's now um, quarter two. So I just um, away. I think we're all if I can take so two seconds just to save these pictures and find them again. <laughs> Here we go. Got to put them in the right place. Right. Now I've got to be able to find them. And then and then I'll be ready. Okay, that's that. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, we are. Um, uh, we are um, reckon for, re ready for the second uh, part of the uh, uh, of the program, and we're changing the program now. Uh, Angel has got some uh, um, parenting duties to to see to a little bit later, so uh, we're putting um, Angel on first. And that will be followed by Andy and then Bill. Uh, Angel is talking to us about the use of the flabiol um, in the city of Barcelona for the Dance of the Giants. And um, his title is The Use of the Flabiol uh, in the Giants of the City of Barcelona and its Role in Supporting Tradition. Does power matter? This will be followed by Andy Richards and uh, with our old New World theme, Early Jamestown Tabering. Uh, merriment and battling from an old world to a new. Uh, Jamestown was one of the first settlements uh, in the uh, English colonization of North America. And then Bill Tuck follows on in the similar theme with From the Mayflower to the Maypole of Merrymount, Puritan and Pilgrim attitudes towards traditional customs in the early 17th century. Of course, this is uh, Mayflower 400 year. And uh, I was due to be taking part in lots of Mayflower 400 things down in Plymouth, but um, uh, sadly they've all been cancelled. So if I can uh, cancel my spotlight and put the spotlight on Angel. And um, welcome Angel from Cambrils in uh, Catalonia, the Republic of. <laughs> oh, how do you do? Greetings from Cambrils in the Catalan Republic. Thank, thank you very much, everybody. I, I apologize for my disastrous pronunciation <laughs> at first, because I don't usually speak English, but I think uh, we will understand e each other. Uh, I will present my, my paper here that starts saying if there is a festive festive troupe that has enjoyed historical continuity in the city of Barcelona and in Catalonia in general is that of the giants. I hope you know all what's a, a giant. In Barcelona, there is a huge number of figures of this type owned by neighborhoods, schools, and associations of any kind. But uh, apart from some more emblematic than others due to the antiquity or fame, 
the one that enjoys the greatest uh, public procession is the known as Gegants de la Ciutat, municipally owned and currently managed by an entity in charge of the maintenance, care and public display in celebrations of very varied nature. The Gegants de la Ciutat is considered one of the oldest, oldest in the country, if not the oldest, whose first documentary references uh, date back from the 15th century. By municipal protocols, they enjoy certain prerogatives in terms of municipal, municipal representation when entertaining illustrious visitors in moments of maximum solemnity, in addition to leading the festive processions of the city. But for centuries, the public procession of the giants cannot be understood without their musical accompaniment. To be more precise, with the, without the presence of the flabulator, an individual musician who plays an instrumental ensemble composed by a small one-handed flute known as flabiol. I think everybody knows what's a flabiol. You can see here, it's not just three holes. This is mine. And a tower, you can see this one, the most usual on the streets, and the other one, the cobbler of Sardanas. We will speak of them later. Well, pertinent questions are already raised with the case that they intend to problematize. How has such public uh, continuity been given to such a small instrumental formation in a cosmopolitan city like Barcelona, being able to count on the participation of great bands or other fashionable formations to accompany such distinguished figures as giants? So can this simple musician have more symbolic power than any other possibility available? How has there been in the last 10 years, a process of reinforcement in the presence of such, such musicians? Well, the question that leads this paper is how it was possible this. Flavio e Tamburi, a minimal musical ensemble, has a such market durability in a urban cosmo cosmopolitan and modern context like Barcelona. To talk about the giants in Barcelona, it is inevitable to mention the Catholic solemnity of Corpus Christi, of which it will be not necessary right now to entertain the details of this or its origins since there, is, uh, since there is a vast bibliography available to anyone. I must clarify that Barcelona has had the presence of more than one pair of giants since uh, ancient times generally linked to parishes and logical given its condition of processional element, which with variability depending on the time and other factors. But as a symbol of power that they have been an heir who has disposed the, of these figures with more continuity has undoubtedly been the city council. Indeed, the different municipal corporations have had an especial interest in demonstrating their ability to control the life of the city, power in short, in the Corpus Christi procession. In order, in order to be able to speak with something that belongs to music, and I won't say music, I do not mean only the melodies, but the entire apparatus associated with the production of sound, that has accompanied the giants in Barcelona or anywhere else, part of Catalonia, we cannot go back to the initial moments of the documentary story. On the contrary, we did not begin to have news written or iconographic until the 17th century and always scarce of information. Things will change remarkably at the beginning of the 19th century when the AUKUS illustrated the Corpus Christi procession and other festivities in which the giants appear with the inseparable musicians, generally pipe and tower, 
or sporadically someone else like the Sac de Jamex, the bagpipe, or the fiddle. It will be even more abundant from mid-century. Uh, please, uh, Steve, if you can show the image number one. Image number one, let me find it. Image number one. So, share screen. Well, here you can see a pair of, of giants in the middle of the 19th century. It's a fan illustrated with giants in the Corpus Christi procession made by Joan Lorenz. In the middle of the giants, you can see the Flavio Lyra. It's a long, a long pipe he's playing, but it, at this moment, uh, there was not evidence of uh, pipe playing in Catalonia. Uh, so it must be a, a Flavio. At the end of the century, Photography and cartoons take the Im image of the giants and of course, musicians finding that was always a performer of Flavio Itamburi. Even more important will be the role of romanticism and folklore researchers who at the turn of the century will dedicate themselves to compiling the melodies that were used. In addition to wondering about the figure of the musicians whom they will consider after survivals of the old minstrels. The main aesthetic, political, and philosophical currents of the moment prevailing in pre-civil war, Catalonia, romanticism, nocentism, and republicanism, will advocate maintaining the figure of the individual musician of Flaviol and Tamburi as a genuine form of musical accompaniment of the giants. Coincidentally, with what is evocated by folklorists. After the civil war, the musician accompaniment, accompaniment will continue to be performed by flaviolators of the oral tradition with organological and interpretative forms different from what we call cultured flaviolators. This will end, end up replacing those at the end of the 1940s and will remain in the position on, until the Flavio will be irretrievably cornered by, in the 80s by the omnipresent Gralle or other most musical formations following the fashion of the moment. But at the beginning of the 90s of the last century, with the change in the organizational and ideological model of Barcelona festivals, a gap was open that allowed the re-entry of the Flavio in the troop of the giants. First, in a tiny way and in very specific moments with a high symbolic content to pass already in 2009 to be the official and permanent accompaniment. And not only that, but with a broad and innovative training. Let's talk about the giants as a symbol. The festive protocol of the city of Barcelona establishes that some of the elements in the Seguici Popular, basically the giants of the city and the eagle, must participate due to their symbolism in acts of protocol in which their presence is required, such as large events, etc., as I said before. As symbols, giants condense an amount of meanings that sometimes become apparent, apparent naked aid, and others not. We know that giants of the city incorporate a while over here the meaning of childish, but just seeing the figures, we show many more like, to name a few, old by medieval costumes they were today powerful because of his height and royal attributes, rich of his regalia and attributes again, benign for the peaceful continents. But the giants are an economic ac uh, activity too. It is obvious that the simple exercise of these figures, existence of these figures, sorry, has required paying money to a craftsman to be vile. 
that for them to look with the minimum of the quorum if it is necessary to pay tailors, dressmakers, hairdressers, and so on. But in the cultural context of our days, there are uh, activities related to them that it seems intolerable that they are paid. I mean the porters and the musicians of the giants. The new wares of the festive reactivation that ran throughout Catalonia since the death of Franco produced a surge of volunteerism uh, that left the participation for profit in these festive troops. All these, of course, with the approval of the public administrations that put them under their control by distributing uh, subsidies. It is mid 80s that wanting to turn around the festive heritage Barcelona. As they believe most of my interviewees, the giants came a few years very black by the municipal sloppiness to them and by vision more renewal of those who designing the popular festivals that relegated to a backseat to the strength of the new troops. The management of a, a society gave them a new life, but with changes. One of the most relevant was the disappearance, disappearance of mercenary por porters, as several of the interviewees and even some authors likes to use. Something similar happened with the music that accompanied the Jaggers. Whatever it was paid directly for the municipal coffers or subcontracted by the successive teams that closed agreement with the city council, the Flavio later always collected. And to tell the truth, he used to be the best paid of all those who participate in his performances. According to Javier Cordomi, who for years has organized popular festivals on behalf of the Barcelona City Council, in the 80s, following the fashion of the moment, groups of renowned grelliers were hired. This means that they were also paid, but the plethora of musical formations that run and run today selflessly playing the territory behind some giants projected an undesirable image of them. This image persists today as highlight members of the group of Spardigots, actual musicians of the Gigants de la Ciutat. Indeed, many of the giants value more the, the goodwill music, having come more than a few politicians who they say Ignore them, often ordering them to go out and play more time to the needed to avoid any imbalances between their great service and what is charged or the heavy hungry with few manners to which they are subject by the municipal technicians. In my opinion, this voluntarism is the fruit of the late capitalism, a kind of disenchantment in the Weberian sense of the term, on the part of the actors who were gaining prominence at that time, the volunteers, who were reincanted by unconsciously rising, rising up against the economic practice that contaminated, in this, in this opinion, the purity of that common good that was the festival and the cultural heritage. Although it is anachronism to use uh, this term in those years. And dialectically, this position was appropriated and reworked by those in power, economical and political, to use it for the benefit of the institutions that represent it. The reactivated gigants. In the 80s, work was done to institute a new festive model that began to be built from a new interest that included a whole series of troops with the historical baggage. The reintroductions of festival that had disappeared for decades. The mod modus operating was clear. We worked with what we had and what we did not have we made that. It was most a job recreation and in invention that research and investigation. Reflection of the new festival interest 
was carried out with groups, associations, and federations, but driven and guided by the Council. The fact of writing a protocol was not enough, but there also had to be an adequate means NSN with good craftsmen to restore the pieces, adequate clothing for the porters, good musicians to interpret the dances, etc. It was not until 1993 when the initial interest project had already been completed that what had been done down up to that moment began to be polished and the musical part being one of those that received more attention from them on. Then let's talk about the Flaviolators. Who were they and who are they? These musicians, Jackals first and Minstrel then, can combine the musical activity with all those. But do, do not forget that we are in a period which will last until the 19th century in the exercise of any professional activity will govern by the uh, strict rules of the guild that will affect both the exercise of the, the profession and its learning. The evolution of the guilds at the beginning of the 19th century and the organological changes and in musical testers, such as of the appearance of the music bands, we with the flabulators relegated to a marginal situation, becoming, in most cases, uh, musicians on the fringes of the more or less regulated teaching channels and with reasons for acting far from the wealthy places. From then on, the flabulator will continue to be an specialist musician who will be able to run to learn the trade and self-talk ways, as well as with a, a teacher, combining, of course, musical practice with another economic activity. Most of the time, a laborer, because of the social use of the flavial, mainly displaced to rural areas where, until they, until well into the 20th century, we he will will stay still animate square dances in addition to the accompaniment of troops in ceremonial processions. At the same time, another time of Flaviolaida will appear, which I have called Culturize, uh, which will do so in, in the new Sardana Scobla, a formation of minstrels reformulated. Of course, these changes were not carried out at one stroke but rather a process that culminated in the late 19th and early 20th century. But by then, the Cobla Flaviolaire had already specialized in that specific musical practice, being, being more an orchestral musician rather than, rather than a street musician, needing to know music theory and with almost virtuosistic aptitudes. Let us also not forget that these flaviolators will be concentrated, concentrated until the beginning of the 20th century in the northern part of Catalonia, in many parts, and remember in many parts of the Catalan territory, Sardana was introduced almost in unison with football of cycling. <laughs> and we'll begin to occupy the positions with until then occupied the traditional flaviolators rather late. Uh, let me show you, here you can see, a flaviol of Cobla that you can see, it's recorded with keys and which it, it's able to play uh, higher notes. Okay. You can see here the, the difference between each other. But the representation of the rustic flaviolite self-made as the fruit of popular genius will be tempting for aesthetic and political movements such as romanticism, nocentism, and republicanism. And they will seek above others, those musicians who are taught uh, not from local areas, rural areas, sorry, project that image of authenticity. 
at this time, we will begin to have photographic images, names, and written histories of the flaviolites that accompany the Gegants de la Ciutat, a selected and almost uh, mythologized group of interpreters who will carry out this function until practically the middle of the 20th century, almost, almost disappearing from the scene at, and being replaced it by couple of flaviolites. That by then will be practically the only ones that remain apart from some very specific results. The late, the latter will be the case until the aforementioned entry of the Gralle in the musical scene of popular festivals and in the first moments of the reintroduction of the flaviol in the accompaniment of Gegans. At the end of the first decade of the century, they will be musicians for the reinvention of the folk music, then combine a good part of the characteristics of all kinds of flavial items seen so far. What did they play and who, uh, what do they, they play? Until the 18th century, we have not an approximation of what could be the repertories uh, music that musicians, flaviolites, put into practice for the musical accompaniment of the Jagans. But we can at least imagine that what was sounded when they appeared and believe that should be fashionable, uh, fashionable melodies in each, each era. And furthermore, that they were not endemic of the, to the city neither to Catalonia nor the Iberian Peninsula, but they ran throughout Europe. We are not sure for, of examples to support this assumption. If we, will, if we look at the music used in the 18th century to accompany the Barcelona Eagle, we will see from its analysis that pieces such as Mantuano, Espanoletas, or later country dances were performed. At the beginning of the following century, in 1805, we know that the James came out to give the country dance, which again a test to the test of four repertories at that current time. Advancing that century, the first compilations and songbooks begin to appear with collect, at least in part, the repertories used by the musicians uh, studied here. Thanks to the in-depth study of Pau or Peer repertory, uh, please, Steve, uh, if you can show the picture number two, please. Hang on, just um, bring that back up. Oops. Well, you can see here the image uh, of the giants of the city in the, the end of the second decade of the 20th century. In the middle, you can see Pau Orpí. <clears throat> uh, he was called El Matador, but no, not as a bullfighter. Matador is a pig killer. Pau Orpí's repertory, <clears throat> which could be extrapolated to any musician of the time, with a minimum of skills, we know that the vision of music and dancers, among them those of giants, was very different, different from what is usually today aimed at the patrimonialization, much more interested in novelty, aesthetics, choreographic adaptability, and melodic simplicity. It was possible to keep a good part of the repertory or pre existing one for whatever circumstances, but there was no hesitation to contributing any other melody of. <clears throat> the repertoires used by the success, successors of these flaviolites of oral tradition, those of Cobla de Sardanas, were different as was their performance aesthetic closer to that crystal, crystallized by folklorism. With the recovery of the flaviol, more symbolic than functional in the accompaniment of Jagans in the 19th, a couple of flaviolites was added again, followed 
by Mar Riera, my friend, one of the members of the Os Perdigots groups. Riera gave a twist to the repertory and as he, uh, he himself explained it, to the way of playing music to take the Jayans dance. It was a form closure to what they currently do with their group, which is perfectly understandable, which made a very good impression to the porters who expressed the greatest facility in being able to dance to that music. Its repertoire is made, made up of dancers from the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries, country dances, polkas, waltzes, jota waltzes, Paso Dobles, Scottish, Mazurkas, Rumbas, Marches, Corrandas, Habaneras, Rigodons, Couple, Jotas, Lanceros, Sardanas, Ancient, and even versions of groups from the 80s and 90s. In addition, of course, to the tunes typical of the interior dances, among which those associated with the Gigants of the Ciutat de Barcelona should be highlighted. Largely, the result of research from the group itself on the flaviolitis that have had accompanying them in the first half of the 20th century. How were they shown to us and how are they shown to us? The first thing to know is that there are a few graphic representations at least during, during the 18th and 19th centuries that showed the giants without the corresponding musician and without one of the portraits doing collection. In the same way, photography will not do either when uh, you choose to, to immortalize the image of the troop posing. Furthermore, the flaviolitis themselves will take great care to appear in a prominent place, place and in attitude to play so that they craft and good work are recorded. Tomas Bosch and Power Peer were two masters of posing uh, before the giants. Uh, I don't know if I have another picture to show you. This one? Yeah. For example, Steve, yes, this one. This is the, the poster of the, the Festival of Igualada, uh, a city in the central Catalonia. Look, it's 1934 in the Repub Spanish Republic. Eh? And here you can see El, El Matador, Power P, playing he, his instrument. Eh? Republicism, Republicanism uh, has not forgot the, the tradition. The Flaviolator is the other at home, an exotic character who is among us and who's whose image is worth exploiting as a prototype of the desirable in a good popular party. In short, acting for the Gigants was a source of prestige that was exploited by the Flaviolators, who did it since they saw that they could turn him into new hires and or make them pay more. These are all speeches that define what is or is not appropriate in our formulation and our practices in relation to a particular topic or place of social activity. What acknowledge is considered useful, relevant, and true in that context. And what kinds of people or subjects embody uh, those characteristics, as say by uh, Stuart Hall in 2011. Let's talk about tradition and modernity. Uh, for me, it's a useless discussion. A recurring discussion, both in the media and some more or less erudit speeches, is that of the coexistence uh, between or not, or the combination or not, of tradition of modernity. I think at this point, it is already possible, possible to realize that this is a discussion that brings us uh, nowhere, science both as merely a soci social construct, an ideology that cannot be measured by objective parameters, and perfectly definable rather, as, an, as has already been said, uh, we are faced with discourses. 
what I intend, uh, what I intend in this section is to show how this type of debate is more the result of a late modernity than a problem present in, a, in all historical periods. The giants in the construction of a Barcelona identity, the totalizing symbolic value of the giants that are municipal property cannot be compared in the, in the eyes of not a few agents to the symbolic value of those who are a part of the city in a neighborhood. Consequently, past prototype metonymy does not work in this field. The sum of the parts is not more than the total. The gigants de la ciutat do represent it. All the others together, no. <clears throat> Despite the enormous work of patrimonialization carried out in the style of the levi strauss bricolaire, <clears throat> a considerable number of agents from the field do not believe that it has been allowed to penetrate deep into the citadel. Coincidentally, there is a patrimonialism movement made up of, of several, several groups of Catalan giants who rise up against the more playful and less careful vision of the festive practice. Gralla occupied the place of Flaviol for a few years, but the search of the Barcelona identity, very much guided by the expert acknowledge that the agents of the field with more responsibility were a kiting, felt practice, and research led to this trend was reversed in Barcelona. This, as I said, is something at least unexpected, since uh, in a cosmopolitan city like Barcelona and with the antecedents what we have been breaking down throughout this war, it was highly expected that in the set of that Barcelonity, they would choose, for example, by some of the bands that have proliferated in recent years that combine traditional instruments and brass section. But no, they have opted for the flobiol, although, yes, with adaptations to be able to compete in noisy environments like those in which the giant usually moves. Uh, please, Steve, uh, number four. Here you can see the group uh, of Spardigots that plays uh, with the giants of the de la ciutat. You can see uh, on the on the right uh, a brass instrument, which is called fiscorn, and the other th three flavials. I love this this picture because you can see the poster here. Uh, which says pro sirol stop noise <laughs> uh, well <laughs> uh, in conclusion giants of barcelona have a long history with continuous changes at all levels from the image to the ceremonial functions from music to the symbolic representations, and they have been uh, and are focusing on the giants of municipal property, although in Colby extrapolated to many others. They have been and are a manifestation of power. In more recent times, it is shown to us as a kind of hierophany that marks the good, the desirable, the benevolent power, a self identification a concatenation of accelerated changes in recent years is in my opinion, one, a succession of enchantments and disenchantments and re-enchantments. I have remarked a lot during the war that the patrimonial activation in which we currently find ourselves is explained by a search for the Barcelona, Barcelona identity, but I continue to think that patrimonial activations cannot be explained solely through identification, since this is rather an intermediate consequence between such activations and the reaction against modernity. 
But in this conclusion, I have not said anything yet about the Flaviola Itamburi. Following Hernandez in 2008, for me, uh, Flaviola and Itamburi with the giants of the Sutats, it's a zombie, a heritage zombie, whose energy is the product of a life bred in form bred in from the present by some living instances who, for various reasons, are interested in re rescuing fragments of the past. The patrimonial zombie thus enjoys an artificial life. It is a life connected to the machine of the emergencies of the present. This is said by Hernandez. A zombie that, indeed, enjoys a livelihood with the gigants de la ciudad but it is still a zombie who deprived of the vital flaws offered by these Barcelon Barcelonian characters has a painful life that can hardly be uh, nourished except by its exoticism. An ugly paradox of being exotic at home. In case anyone has any doubt about it, ask any of, of Perdigots how many performances they contract as a group away from the slope of the giants of the Dalla Ciutat. Thank you very much. There we go. Thank you, um, Angel. That's absolutely fascinating. Uh, I see so Thank many much. Uh, 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 parallels there with um, you know, the professional, as we were talking earlier about the professional uh, Tabara for Morris dance, the man who was paid, and yes. um, and uh, that may be part of his downfall in the end. Um, I I think not many people uh, watching will will know about the the tradition of giants it goes back a long time, doesn't it? The, the gigants, five hundred years. Uh, gigants uh, started to appear in the fifteenth century. Yeah. The, the first uh, note we have is in, in Barcelona, precisely. And they have changed a lot uh, uh, during the, those years, those centuries. Yeah. I mean, in England, we had a similar tradition. Again, on the... Uh, so that they, in, in Catalonia, they perform on the Festa Major, the patronal saint's day of the church, but also you said uh, Corpus Christi. Yes. yes, the beginning of these uh, traditions, it seems, come from the Corpus Christi processions. Right, yeah. And I, I with, think the, we, with we, the modernity and the illustration, the Corpus Christi has been down and the municipal power has promoted the patronal festivities. All ah, right, so it, it was more, uh, Corpus Christi is definitely more a re religious day than the uh, the festa major well uh, it's more religious for us today but i don't think so uh, uh, a century ago yeah. because it, it, it was the the big uh, fest of of barcelona and in many other the size we we see corpus Christi today uh, as a very religious thing but in in centuries ago, it was very different. It was more popular yeah. and more column, of course. I think that was uh, uh, definitely the case in England, where we had um, uh, we had giants performing at Corpus Christi and at, um, on the uh, on the patronal day. And um, I, Jez has just um, noted on the chat there that um, we have one giant surviving from. Uh, 500 years ago, and that is uh, Christopher, and he's in Salisbury, and uh, he, he took part in the processions there. But in the 16th century, we lost all of those religious processions, and yeah. Morris dancing was part of that. Morris, that uh, Morris dancing was spread throughout the country because of those church processions, and um, the Puritans banned it, <laughs> and we lost it completely. So um, it, some giants carried on in England in processions um, like the town 
uh, civic processions, not religious processions. But uh, I, the parallels for me were very interesting in your thought. Oh, there's my dog. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but um, uh, today, my question is, is, is this, um, are the, Holly, Chevy, are the, um, Maybe he's a puritan. Huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Are the um, when you uh, play the music for the giants, are you paid for that expenses or a payment? Mm, I can say that in with the giants of Barcelona, it's well paid. It is well paid. Yeah, yeah. it's well paid. But uh, as I said before. There's many musicians, they play for nothing. Yeah. For nothing. Because uh, they understand that the volunteerity is the most important than the music. I'm going to have to mute. Um, hang on. <laughs> yes, in, uh, in Salisbury, uh, there's, uh, there's a in Salisbury, there's a long tradition of the uh, the Salisbury Giants, and, and there it was linked to the one of the guilds. I can't remember which which guild it was who who organised the um, the procession. And um, and as as Steve says, it it had Morris dancing as well. And um, similar things happened in London as well, I believe. I think there were some giants involved with with Morris dancers and, and other processing people. Um, there's a big guild involvement in uh, in those uh, midsummer watch processions. Yeah. Could you could you see a link to the mystery plays then? No, I don't see them in in, in England. But um, back to what Andy was saying, the um, it was the Tailors Guild in um, in Salisbury, and what happened? The guilds, uh, like in the mystery plays, the guilds took responsibility for putting on mystery plays, a particular plays. They also took responsibility in some towns for organizing parts of the procession. And in those towns, when the Reformation happened, the guilds carried on, but made it into a civic procession. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Lord Mayor's procession in London is entirely a civic procession and they still have giants. They had to replace the ones that were burnt in the Blitz and they still have Morris dancers, which uh, I was able to do. Um, but anyway, I want to cast the the, the floor open to um, any other questions for um, for Angel from um, from the YouTubers um, and the chatters. I've got a question. Well, uh, two questions for Angel. Really, uh, you've talked about the the giants and gigants around Catalonia, but the tradition of giants is quite widespread throughout different parts of Spain as well, isn't it? Um, across the north of Spain. Uh, how, how widespread is it? That's the first question. Secondly, in other parts of Spain, is are the giants accompanied by pipe and tabor players or by different music combinations? Yes. Uh, uh, giants are in all, almost all of Spain. Uh, the most important part of them are on the north, from Madrid to north. And, but in Catalonia, there is the most important number of them. Uh, the number in Catalonia is, I don't know exactly, but maybe there, there are 3,000 mm -hmm. uh, giants. Maybe, yeah, I, I don't know exactly. And it's almost the, the total of the rest of, of Spain. Uh, the musical accompaniment, there, there is uh, many variations. For example, in, on the Basque country, it's almost always uh, played by Chistu, and other sides with Dolcina, and other sides with Backpipe. And in Catalonia, uh, the most usual is Gralla. Yeah, so you quite know. a variety then. A quiet instrument. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, I know the gralia. Uh, yeah, yes, the gralia. That's uh, mm -hmm. the, to explain. The gralia is a uh, 
is a forerunner of the oboe and is and is a very loud outdoor shawm, isn't it? Right. Um, yes, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Angel. That's fascinating uh, uh, talk, and I was interested in the parallels. God, what would have happened if uh, if uh, uh, um, the uh, uh, Franco had not uh, uh, come along? You know, uh, how how well would the the, the system have survived. I know it had to be revived, but if it had been a continuous history, you know, it might have changed in very different ways. Um, uh, it's it's fascinating to think. Yeah. This is long to to explain. I, I would need uh, <laughs> <laughs> many hours. <laughs> a, a whole symposium. Anyway, thank you very much, Angel. Thank you very much. Uh, very pleased to have you uh, taking part and. Um, and uh, and uh, um, an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. And um, what I'd like to do now is um, we're going to go to uh, Andy Richards, the uh, the chair of the Tabra Society, um, who's going to talk to us about um, early Jamestown tabering. Uh, I'm going to flick cross there from that and uh, make Andy. I gather you all, there we go, Andy. Spotlight there, spotlight on Andy. <laughs> Hello everybody, so, um, wow. I mean, we've had some amazing presentations so far. So yeah, that, that's really quite incredible. Um, really pleased with all of those presentations so far. Um, now this one is about um, early Jamestown and uh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be having a go at sharing my screen, which is not something that I'm terribly familiar with. So if this all goes pear shaped, then I'm assuming that Steve will rescue me. So, uh, so here we go. So I'm looking at one particular taborer in the early 17th century Jamestown settlements and uh, there's some merriment that goes on, uh, we think, and there is definitely battling of this New World settlement to survive. And we're going to be looking at the background and context, some of the high points and uh, some possible questionable points of this pipe and tabor playing into, into a new world. Yeah, interesting stuff. So really, why, why, would, why would people want to move from the old world to the new world settlements like, like Jamestown in the early 17th century? Um, well, adventurers, they really had quite a key point, uh, key part to play in this. So, um, uh, this is Sir Walter Raleigh, a very fine picture of him, I think. I wish, I really wish that I, uh, I owned a costume like that. But basically, he, he really wanted uh, fame and fortune. Um, and the spelling of his name uh, he can be spelt in different ways. Um, here we've got it spelt R-A-L-E-G-H. That's one of the ways that he spelt it. Um, the crown was very important in this whole process. So, um, yeah, Queen Elizabeth I, um, in this picture, she's, um, she's pictured holding the globe symbolically uh, in her hand um, and obviously um, very keen to, to um, do better than the Spanish at this time in history. Um, England is very keen about, you know, to do all of that kind of stuff. And she really wanted prestige, power, and resources from these remote um, heathen and barbarous lands, which is pretty, now we would say that's a pretty terrible way to look at it. But that's the way she, she looked at it at the time. So she gets replaced by James I, um, quite a nice picture of him here. 
yeah, I wish I had this costume too. <laughs> um, yeah, what would I, I would really love to have this costume. <laughs> anyway, um, Sir Walter Raleigh did not impress James I. Um, he, he also wanted prestige power resources, but there were some courtiers who were really um, quite keen to, um, to profit from his demise. Now, the crew are obviously very important, and, um, well, why would they want to move to um, a New World settlement like Jamestown uh, in the early 17th century? Well, basically, they wanted fame and fortune, and um, they also had some, some very strong motivations. Um, some of them would have been religious some economic, some political, and they, they really wanted to forge a new community. And um, there were lots of constraints in English society at the time, and I would imagine that many of the crew would have really been very, very keen to get away from those, those constraints. Right, well, where is Jamestown anyway? Where is it going to be founded? Um, so if you look on Google, it, it gives you this... Um, 3,582 miles from Plymouth to Jamestown. It's a pretty long way, isn't it? Um, actually, they they went even further than that in their voyage. Um, uh, they did they did go from uh, from London, and um, yeah, well, basically. Um, approximately four and a half months of sailing via the Canaries and and Puerto Rico. So um, they didn't even go direct. Can you imagine what it would have been like to, um, to dedicate four and a half months of your existence on um, a crowded ship of the time? It must have been pretty horrendous. They must have been extremely motivated to, um, to want to do that. Well, um, yeah, why was there a Tabra in Jamestown? Um, well, since the 15th century, um, pipe and Tabra in England, it, it was the expected instrument for Morris dancing. Um, yeah, it, if somebody said, oh, there's Morris dancing down the street, then people would expect it to be pipe and Tabra music. And, um, and in the early 1600s, it's also popular for country dancing, and you have very popular theatrical performances by Taborers, such as Will Kemp, who, of course, danced from London to Norwich in, in 1600. A huge publicity stunt and really, really popular at the time. So he was a, he was a real superstar of the time. So, okay, why was there a Tabor in Jamestown? Well, we, we know from the three Tabor pipes that were recovered from the wreck of Henry VIII's warship, the, the Mary Rose, that, um, yeah, fighting ships did carry pipe and Tabor players. Um, yeah, interesting stuff, isn't it? It's a lovely picture of the Mary Rose there, isn't it? Beautiful artwork, really like that picture. Um, so really, it's it's part of the usual military band in in the Elizabethan navy, uh, which might seem a bit strange to us now. Um, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with the the crucial um, battle of Lepanto uh, when the Turks were uh, repulsed by Don John of Austria. In 1571, um, basically he he inspired his his fleet by dancing a galliard on, on the deck of his ship. Gosh, it must have been an amazing sight. Um, this battle decisively turned the tide against the Turkish onslaught on Christian Europe. Um, I do wonder whether the music was pipe and tabor. It's an interesting speculation. Now, uh, in 1582, um, we have uh, Edward Fenton's investigation of, of a passage, um, and his, his ship 
actually carried pipe and table and his his ski, his ship is referred to as a a skiffy which i think is a rather a fine uh, <laughs> rather a fine description of a ship but it's it's lovely to know that there was there was a pipe and table on there as, as well as trumpets drum and and fife so it's an important instrument for uh, for anything nautical at the time so in 1607 um, the cruise sailing to Jamestown contained Nick Scott drum. So we know he played the drum, and he might have been the tabra who's documented in Jamestown in 1610. Well, okay, let's carry on. So the early Jamestown settlement was very much um, a struggle to survive. Um, so Raleigh had got the support of Elizabeth I for his um, attempt to found a colony at, at Roanoke near the future Jamestown. But uh, when, a sh when a relief ship came three years later, um, the colonists had, had basically disappeared and, and presumably died out. Um, yeah, it's a shame that the relief ship was so late and it had been delayed by the Spanish Armada and, and then a search for gold in Cuba gold in Cuba, which, um, which was not successful. So in 16, yeah, the 1607 colonists of Jamestown, they, they, they really found no sign of gold here. And uh, they were attacked by the indigenous tribes. So yeah, it really was a struggle to survive. Right, well, we have reference to some merriment. Now this gentleman in the picture here, um, yeah, he does look a little bit merry, I guess, but I don't think I'd want to get on the wrong side of him. Um, so a, a key um, a key source we have is John Smith's general, general history of Virginia, New England, and the Summer Isles. And he says that um, merry times were had with the Kikatan people the week following Christmas 1608. So the colonists were um, stopping at Kikatan for about a week on their way to negotiate with um, the indigenous leader, Pal Hatan, and uh, get some corn from him. So, so basically the extreme wind, rain, frost and snow caused us to keep Christmas amongst the savages where we were never more merry nor fed on more plenty of good oysters, fish, flesh, wild fowl, and good bread. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, given all the privations and challenges that they had, I guess, uh, this must have been a welcome time of relief, really. So, yeah. Well, we don't actually know whether pipe and table would have been played, but we know the colonists had a, a Tabra in 1610, so it does seem extremely possible. Right, Jamestown, starving calamity and drum. So, in the starving time, winter of 1609 to 1610, only 60 of 500 English colonists survived. Um, the Indian killed without, if our men stirred, but beyond the bounds of their blockhouse, as famine and pestilence did within. And our governor commanded every man at the beating of the drum to repair aboard. And thus Jamestown was abandoned. So, gosh, a very challenging time. Well, um, this man here, he doesn't look like a Tabra, does he? No, he's not a Tabra. Um, this is Sir Thomas Gates, and reinforcements arrived for him in 1610. So Sir Thomas Gates, being desirous to be revenged upon the Indians at Kekauhatan, did go hither by water with a certain number of men, and amongst the rest, a Tabra with him. Being landed, he caused the Tabra to play and dance, thereby to allure the Indians to come unto him, the which prevailed. 
and then, espying a fitting opportunity, fell in upon them. So the Kikitan were defeated and they were driven out of the lower Virginia Peninsula and the colonists were able to um, harvest the corn there. So, so this paper has looked in context at one particular Tabra in, in this early 17th century Jamestown settlement. And when we play pipe and tabor tunes of the early 17th century, um, perhaps it's easy to ignore some of the challenges that Taborers and, and many other people faced. And some felt so pressured that they were prepared to sail for four and a half months across the Atlantic and then try and survive in this really challenging environment in the new world. Um, but in battle, in skilled hands, even a pipe and tabor could be a decisive weapon. Well, that's it. So perhaps we can reflect on the determination of this Jamestown Tabra, even if we very much prefer to play in collaboration with diverse cultures today, and even if we really like to focus on the merriment. So anyway, I guess for us at the moment, here's to the merriment. Well, thank you very much, Andy. Very interesting, Andy. Well done. I heard there was a Tabarer on board, but I knew nothing about him until now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we know very much. <laughs> no, no, I think you've pulled together everything there is to know. <laughs> it's nice to be able to put a name to the Tabarer, isn't there? It's very... Well, we don't know if it was him. We, we know that he... That there was this Nick Scott chap that went with the drum and was right, right. presumably, presumably, <laughs> the, presumably <laughs> the person who drummed drummed them as they retreated from the place yeah. when there were only fifty of them left. But did he whether, did he survive? I don't think we know. <laughs> well, there's no uh, nothing known about Nick Scott or his was it Nick Scott. Nick or Scott, his life yeah. or anything? I don't know anything. No, no. Okay. What well, What do we know about the pipes from the Mary Rose, Andy? Um, they've been measured and re reconstructed. Um, there are various different sizes. One of them is extremely large. Um, it's uh, it's. I think it's like a sort of a low. A low G one, I believe. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, someone else might be able to uh, give more chapter and verse on, on, on those pipes. I haven't prepared my uh, my script to, to be able to answer that question immediately. I'm afraid. It, you just think, you know, just as now for Morris that we use the high D just because it cuts through everything. You think they might have. Um, because I was struck when I went to the Mary Rose Museum about the length of the pipes and why they weren't using the shorter, higher pitch ones. Was this just to be friendlier on board ship, maybe? Well, I think it's a possibly a different context in that um, the, uh, uh, the, the pipes on Mary Rose, they were all, um, when we, we got a, um, a set of them delivered to the festival, uh, was it the first festival or the second festival? Um, uh, they'd just been reconstructed and we confirmed that they played in consort together. So the, the concept of a consort of tabor pipes is quite different from a solo uh, tabra playing out there for a dance. You know, it, it perhaps had wider, um, wider usage and uh, more sophisticated music than, than uh, uh, you know, of, of different kinds. So, um, yeah, uh, and there are other images of Tabras on board ships, uh, British ships, uh, right into the 19th century, uh, being taken out to um, uh, Caribbean and, and the like uh, in, 
and there's a, a marvelous painting in the, uh, I think it's Greenwich, of uh, uh, a young black boy Tabera dressed up in uniform playing in yes. the in the um, in the captain's <coughs> uh, quite extraordinary uh, painting. Yeah, I seem to remember that's quite a small pipe, isn't it? That he's that yeah. one's quite a small pipe. Yeah, yeah, that might. I think it's a later uh, image. I think it's. Um, uh, possibly early 19th century. I can't remember exactly. I, I have a feeling it's late 18th century, that one. It is a, it's a very nice little image, actually. Yeah. So, so when I think of America and War of Independence, I think of fife and drums. So is there, is there a... When did, when did pipe and tabor turn into fife and drums? Um, I, I'm... <laughs> it's part of my talk. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> a small part. I, I, it's one of the it's one of the interesting questions which I I was uh, about to address in the, <laughs> in the quest for the pipe and tabor in the northern colonies of, of North America. <laughs> I was interested in the concept that came earlier that uh, the pipe and tabor. At one time in England was a larger size and then became a smaller size. There's even a thought that this was due to the change from indoor to outdoor performance. And I wonder if that's uh, if that relates to the instruments found on the on the Mary Rose in some way. I don't know. Well, I, I'm not totally, I'm not totally convinced that that and it, it's as simple as that because I. No. I quite a few early examples of quite small pipes and there's certainly a lot of of images uh even even in renaissance period of really quite quite small pipes um yeah. so i i really don't think it's it, the picture is as simple as that no i think you're right it's more complex yeah yeah Phew, I think you've got away without too many questions. That's just... <laughs> you chose a suitably remote, <laughs> obscure topic. Yes. It's, it's, it's just as well because I'm not sure I could have answered any of them. <laughs> like my talk. Um, thank you very much, Andy. And uh, uh, we very much appreciated that paper. That's a, uh, an interesting insight into something I'd heard about that Tabra, but. Uh, uh, never knew much about the context. Right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Andy. Andy. Now we um, now we're going to move to Bill for our final um, talk of the afternoon, and um, the title of Bill's talk is "From the Mayflower to the Maypole of Merrymount: uh, Puritan and Pilgrim Attitudes Towards Traditional Customs in the 17th Century." And uh, uh, away you go, Bill. Right. I will. Um endeavor to i'm on share screen right if i just run my powerpoint it's looking good slides from the beginning excellent i can't see myself but i can see the slides um can i be heard pardon can i can i be heard steve Pardon? <laughs> yeah, yes, you can be heard. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. I have no, I have no image of myself on the screen, but we can um, see you. Yeah. Okay. You can see me. Fine. Here we go. Um, I, well, my talk follows on from from Andy's in that I'm looking at the question of trying to find um, mention or occurrences of the pipe and tabor in the northern colonies of North America, principally New England. Um, there are some rumors of, of, the, of there being pipe and tabor aboard one of the earlier settlements, uh, earlier uh, uh, trips to explorations of, of uh, that part. There's an account of a Morris dance being performed on the shores of Newfoundland in the 1580s by members of the ill-fated second voyage of Sir Humphrey, Humphrey Gilbert, during which, and I'm quoting from the, the journal, I think it is, of the, of, the, uh, of, of the ship, for solace of our people and allurement of the savages, we were provided of music in good variety, not omitting the least toys as Morris dancers, 
hobby horses, and may-like conceits, to the, to the delight of the savage people whom we intended to win by all fair means possible. So it's not really necessarily an account of an event that took place, but of an intention uh, in loading up the, the vessel with um, sundry toys, such as Morris dancers and the rest. <laughs> Anyway, the the uh, the voyage itself was rather ill-fated. I think more than there were several ships involved. Many of them did not return. So this story is is generally regarded as apocryphal. We start therefore on our quest appropriately. This being the four hundredth anniversary with the with the voyage of the Mayflower in sixteen twenty. In England at this time. Uh, and throughout the 17th century, we have numerous accounts and illustrations of pipe and tabor playing for dance, often in conjunction with May Day celebrations or to accompany a Morris dance. This is May Day. Uh, here is another. While dancing around a maypole or performing a Morris was severely frowned upon by the Puritans of the time, dancing itself, accompanied by pipe and tabor or otherwise, was not. So it, it was rather, um, some were much opposed to it, others more or less accepted it, but unlike the Maypole, which was very much frowned upon by the Puritans, dancing itself to the accompaniment of the pipe and tabor wasn't necessarily so. And here, yeah, here is a very interesting illustration, which unfortunately, I, I don't have any access to a, um, a, a, an image, a more detailed image um, that you can actually see the constituent parts of. The important uh, relationship is between this image, which depicts the devil's army besieging a walled city held by a Christian soldier bold, guarded, guarded by figures representing Christian virtues. Um, this is important in that it has been suggested this print, hello. I can't see the image. You can't hear me. I can't see the image. Ah, uh, is there? A, it's here on the right. It's almost. It's not so much invisible as the we're detail just, is very obscure. We're just seeing you. You're not sharing the screen. Okay. Oh, I'm not sharing screen. One moment. Let me do an escape. Um. Share so find if you go back to the. Uh, Zoom I'm on a share screen now. And uh, then you've got to click on the actual. Yeah. That one, uh, hang on. Oh, ah. that like it. Uh, is this better then? Yeah. And now yeah. if you go to um, um, your actual from current slide, perhaps, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, right. right. I, may, I must have put something in the wrong order because I, that seemed very confusing. From the beginning. Now, ah, that's better. Oh, All I need to be able to do now is see myself and I will be convinced of my existence. Uh, you're up at the top of the screen. Right. Here we are. Right. Uh, you have not missed anything much um, except my couple of early pictures, one of which was the, um, the Mayflower, followed by this one of Maypole dancing, very popular in the 17th century, and the next one, which again, a maypole dance to the pipe and tabor. This is the picture I want to draw attention to. Unfortunately, it's, it's on much too small a scale to be able to interpret any of the figures. But it was suggested that this print may have influenced Bunyan, John Bunyan, to write The Holy War, published actually in 1682. John Bunyan, Paul Bunyan. <clears throat> Staunch Puritan to the very end composed his novel, The Holy War, in this period. It contains no fewer than six references to dance with pipe and tabor, all quite positive in their enthusiasm, um, and usually to denote the joint <coughs> celebration to be enacted after the capture of yet another worthy soul, or whole city in this case, for Christianity. So it would be wrong to, to imagine that the pipe and tabor was uh, in any great sense, prohibited to the Puritans in England. Um, and this makes it somewhat surprising that we have no 
you know, clear records um, of it being taken to uh, New England um, aboard the, the, the Puritan ships. However, we shall investigate further. Um, this is the famous Morris dance. Uh, again, the year is, is very interesting. 1620, of course, is the same year uh, as that in which the Mayflower left. So clearly, Morris dancing to the pipe and tabor was very much part of the scene at that time, and quite possibly the scene that they were trying to escape from. So the fact that it was there in England um, may not have meant that they were willing to take either Morris dancing or the pipe and tabor with them. However, we shall explore further. Right, two characters. Oh yeah, I can't see it because it's, it's mine. Sorry, I, can you see that image? Because it's too- Yeah, we can, William Brewster. <laughs> okay, fine, because mine is obscured my own, by my own picture. Um, we two characters feature in the initial part of our story. William Brewster, leader and spiritual advisor of the separatist Puritan sect that eventually sailed off from the Mayflower in 1620. And the second one, a much more interesting chap in a way, Thomas Morton, a firm non-Puritan Anglican humanist who sailed for the New World some two years later, intending to found a rival colony. Both these men were lawyers and had spent time in their early years as members of the Inns of Court, where skill in dance was an obligatory part of their training. Morton is known to have been involved in the great masks at Gray's Inn attended by uh, Queen Elizabeth. Brewster had even been at one time part of the entourage of Queen Elizabeth as attendant to William Davison, her Secretary of State. So he, was, he would have been very familiar with the lavish court masks that were a feature of the Elizabethan court. So this is the, this is the context in which several of the early settlers who went off to New, Ze to New England, nearly said New Zealand then, um, New England, um, they would have been familiar with this. Again, in the case of Brewster, it's quite likely that if he was trying to escape from this, this um, uh, environment, which the separatist Puritans at that time did really regard as rather, as rather decadent. Um, William, uh, uh, Morton, Thomas Morton on the hand was, was much more um, in favor of this kind of thing. That brings me to the end of the first part. So they all set off, um, at least the pilgrim lot, um, in the Mayflower at sea in 1620 with a total complement of 102 passengers, of which around 40, only 40 of those were separate as Puritans. They referred to themselves as saints and the rest of the settlers, they referred to as strangers, plus a crew of around 30. Um, they set off finally in 1620 after various set setbacks which had delayed the sailing. The journey of 66 days to reach the New England coast was generally terrible. And this particular scene is intended to indicate just how terrible the voyage was. Um, actually though, they only lost, only one life was lost during the voyage. Uh, they, unfortunately, because of the, the delays in setting out, they arrived just as winter was settling in. Poorly equipped to begin life on shore, they st stayed aboard ship and over the ensuing winter, about half of them died, mostly from scurvy and other diseases, possibly hunger as well. By now, they were in very, for very poor condition and the survivors attempted to set up camp on shore the following spring. Now, yeah, here we are. At this point, uh, myth takes over from reality and the romanticization and the myth of origins are very clearly displayed in the following set of pictures, almost all of which were painted in the 19th century 
um, or the early 20th. We have very few pictorial records that can be dated back to the 17th century um, and to give a, a, a realistic picture of the, of the original Plymouth colony. So we tend to depend and interpret the whole business in terms of these, this very romanticized view. So here we have them all praying on board the, uh, on board the Mayflower. Another one signing the famous contra compact, which was a compact between, a contract between the settlers as well as the pilgrims that they would support each other um, during this particular advent adventure to set up a colony. They had been intending to go down to Virginia, uh, but that proved impossible or at least very difficult. So they decided that they would um, set up their colony in Plymouth in New England. Uh, next one. And this yet another rather fanciful image of the landing on the shore in Plymouth in 1620. There were 66 days on the voyage, apparently, right, uh, 1848. So all of these have been painted in the, in, the, in the 19th century. And finally, this, the famous Thanksgiving um, episode, which again is probably largely um, mythical, the first say, say, uh, as a representation in 1914. We, we of course have no pictures and only very rudimentary descriptions of the original um, feasting. Um, as I said earlier, only about half of them survived that winter anyway. Right. So here we go. Two characters emerge as important leaders of new colony. The first is William Bradford, official leader of community. And it is to Bradford that, that we owe the most detailed account of the ensuing 30 years of the Plymouth Plantation, as the settlement was called. Unfortunately, and the document is really, it is an interesting read. Unfortunately, this document contains no mention of Pipe and Tabor, and its only mention of dance is a rather scurrilous account of the rival community set up by Thomas Morton nearby at Mount Wollaston. This is where the, the, the picture becomes rather more interesting. Um, uh, Thomas Morton, you remember, was one of the, the lawyers who uh, had, had uh, emerged from the, the environment of, the, of Elizabethan England and had gone off as a bit of an adventurer um, shortly after the pilgrims to try and form a settlement in New England. Um, the second one of Plymouth. Oh yes, this is this is just the the front page of the manuscript of Bradford's account. Uh, Bradford's account of um, the early years of the Pilgrim settlement in Massachusetts, New England. The second the second character we need for the plot. Sorry, this is yeah. Going on to that. This is the, uh, the book that, and this is even more interesting than, the, than uh, Bradford's one. This is a book written by Thomas Morton and gives his rival account of the early years in Massachusetts. The two have to be read as, in, uh, in, 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 as companion pieces. Uh, they're, quite, they're quite different in their tone, and, but both interesting in their own way. Now, the second character is this chap, Miles Standish. He was the hired security officer for the Plymouth Colony. He had been an English, um, in the English army, an English uh, uh, militia man. And um, that his specific role was as security to run the militia. He initially, I don't believe, was actually a Puritan, but um, his military experience was, was quite valuable. He's referred to by Thomas Morton in his book, New Canaan, as Captain Shrimp and Quondam Drummer. Quondam Drummer means former drummer. And this is interesting because it's one of the few specific references that we have to music in both of these uh, uh, important documents that we have. Going on from there. 
Yes, uh, Captain Shrimp. Uh, Morton, Morton refers to him as, as Captain Shrimp. Standish is in charge of the militia. Now, the role of the militia is that it not only guards the community, but also ensures regular church attendance by leading them to prayers with the sound of the drum. And we, have, we do have written records which say they were regularly led to their, their, their um, <clears throat> services, religious services, to the beat of the drum and presumably by the militia. So, the, so it was compulsory church attendance um, led, in, led in by the drum. Drums feature quite extensively in the accounts, but no mention of an, an accompanying pipe. This is the accounts that Morton, well, actually, it's not quite true. I'll come to this later. Where Morton, uh, the accounts that Morton gives, um, as well as the account that Bradford gives of this initial, initial settlement. Now, trying to extend our search a little further, this is, this is the um, a reconstruction of an imagined interior, the imagined interior of the Mayflower. And some things they do have right. And I believe in one of these, there is actually a drum. And from, from Andy's lecture and there of the discussion, it was, it's generally recognized that the musical accompaniment for almost any ship would have been drum, trumpet, pipe and tabor. We have a lot of, it was the, it was the standard complement of in, instruments in ships of any class, any significant class at that time. However, no sign of pipe and tabor, nor any sign of trumpet, which I think is very remiss of those who reconstruct it. But I think they were going on what the record showed, and that was that there weren't any such instruments aboard the Mayflower. Um, this is the collection in the Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth, uh, in New England, Massachusetts now. Uh, and they did manage to collect a lot of items that were gen genuinely thought to belong to the Mayflower Pilgrims. And amongst them, you can see um, Miles Standish's hat a couple of swords and some other fierce looking instruments. I think up in the above left, we have a, looks like the muzzle of a, of a, <clears throat> a musket. And down in the bottom left, a cannon. So they were well equipped for, for um, defending the settlement. The only musical artifact from the Mayflower uh, that has been, that can be uh, for which we have a genuine record, is the Ainsworth Psalter of 1612. So our view should not be that the pilgrims all set off as a happy bunch dancing to the pipe and tabor. No, they sang serious psalms as they were going and on landing. There was not an awful lot of dancing amongst the pilgrims. This is a, um, a reconstruction and probably fairly realistic of Plum Plymouth Plantation in 1627. That's a few years then after the original settlement. So it's very much a, um, a stock, a fortified village with a, with a, a stockade essentially. And um, they have, there is also um, a reconstruction of that um, just on the outskirts, I believe, of Plymouth in Massachusetts these days, where you can see uh, imagined houses, housing of for that initial settlement. Um, the stockade itself, in nor normally when you get one of these little reconstructed villages, uh, as happens down in Williamsburg, you get a, a kind of animated thing where people try to reconstruct the, the, the type of life. There is no record here of anybody playing the pipe and tabor. Unfortunately, I would like to believe that, that there is probably regular performances of, lead, of the militia leading everybody to, ch to church 
for their um, for their religious observances. I, I, I like to believe that happens as a regular on a regular basis in the reconstruction. But of course, no pipe and tabor. Um, we go on to part three. Uh, so oh, sorry, this is the finish of this. Plymouth was a fortified camp with obligatory militia service for all males. The militia led all inhabitants to church services accompanied by drums. Now, there's, although there is no suggestion of a, of a pipe, um, it is likely that very shortly after the settlement, they did introduce the fife. And what seems to happen is that certainly by the end of the century, it's around 1700, the fife had become uh, part of the of the uh, the musical accompaniment to the various to the militias in New England, and it appears very strongly amongst the English bands of that time, which of course until the Revolution, uh, later in that in the 18th century, uh, the English bands would have had their standard accompaniment, which by then had become at uh, drum and fife, two musicians. So what we look at next, however, is the rival settlement of Merrymount. This was set up in 1624 by Thomas Morton. Um, and it here shows we have, again, very few, none, actually, um, genuine images of the settlement. So this is an eight, a nine, oh, sorry, a 19th century a 19th century um, engraving of a picture illustrating an imagined version of Thomas Morton's setup. He didn't actually call it Merrymount, he called it Mar Re Mount, which relates to the sea. And it was a, quite a, it was quite a serious operation. Um, but by the 19th century, they had uh, reimagined it after what the Puritans have called it as Merrymount. The location of this, arrive, oh, sorry, uh, in 1622, he arrives in New England, this is Thomas Morton, with a collection of some 30 young men to serve as indentured labor, and with the ambition to set up a rival community to that of the Puritans uh, of Plymouth Plantation. The location, Mount Wollaston, some 20 miles north of Plymouth Plantation. They called it Ma Ray Mount, but was renamed by the Puritans as Merry Mount. In view of what they regarded as pagan practices, most notably the erection of a male maypole um, and inviting the natives to their May Day celebrations, partly in the hope of finding partners for the young men. They were really rather, they, they were possibly intending to import young women from England, but uh, Thomas Morton quite rightly thought it was a, a much more practical solution to see if he could entice some of the local uh, native maidens to partner up with these young men. We do have an extensive and detailed description of the operation and of the intentions of its founder in his brilliantly satirical book, New Canaan. Unfortunately, there is only the merest hint of pipe and tabor in his account of the May Day celebrations, which involved the setting up of an 80 foot maypole, as we see it here. And it's this, upon May Day, it's quoting from his book, upon May Day, they brought the maypole to the place appointed with drums, guns, pistols, and other fittings, and there erected it with the help of savages. Thomas Morton in New Canaan. So I would like to believe that these other fitting instruments might possibly include a pipe and tabor. We have no, as I said earlier, we have no Ill uh, original illustrations of the settlement of which nothing now remains. All 19th century imaginary reconstructions seem to be based upon the Bruegel the Younger painting of 1637, which I show here. This, of course, is nothing to do with it, but is does show a maypole. It was Peter Bruegel the Younger. Um, I've got the date there, 1634. Anyway, it dates from around that period and seems to have been used uh, by many, many 19th century illustrators as an imagined view of Mary Mount and its maypole. 
Right. Um, well, I'll leave it at that for a moment. The new colony, this is the uh, uh, Thomas, Thomas Morton's colony. The new colony was initially very successful in its trade with the natives, principally for furs. This success, along with their indulgence in what the Puritans would regard as idolatrous or heathen practices, earned them the outrage of the Plymouth separatists, who lost no opportunity to re retaliate by sending a raidy, raiding party to Merrymount to oust Morton and his merry men. And this, again, is a 19th century en engraving of painting. Um, it's Miles Standish, the security chief back there in Puritan Plymouth, um, and his militia surveying the celebrations at Merrymount. And it does look to be rather a jolly party with a keg of beer, which I thought initially might be a drum, but it's a keg of beer underneath the maypole, a lot of cavorting with the native maidens. And um, yeah, I think it's, it, looks, it looks good to me. I wouldn't mind being there. Now, Miles Standish, the quondam, no, I haven't got that one actually. Miles Standish, the quondam drummer, led the raiding party. Uh, and this, this was actually the following year. He duly arrested, the party duly arrested Morton and cut down the maypole. Morton is forced to return to England, but makes his way back to New England a few years later with warrants from the Crown. This would be Charles I by this time. Warrants from the Crown to revoke the charter of the Massachusetts Bay Company on which the rights of settlement of Plymouth Plantation were based. Um, so there was a serious political move by Thomas Morton to revoke the charter of the Puritan settlement in Plymouth and essentially replace it with a, a, um, a crown supported settlement um, based on his uh, ideas of what, a New of what a New England settlement should be like. Unfortunately, the Civil War intervenes. Civil War breaks out 1640. Um, so by the time he gets back, he gets back to about 1637, um, though he has made several trips in the meantime, got into various sorts of skirmish and troubles with the Puritans. But it, the Civil War intervenes and it scuppers his plan. The Puritans De demolish um, all trace of they, they demolish they cut down the the they cut down the, the the maypole I think on several occasions this again is a 19th century engraving of John Enticott who was at that point the governor of Massachusetts Puritan demolish all trace of Merrymount and of Morton's maypole it's not quite the end of the story however uh, that's Endicott. Uh, governor of Massachusetts demolishing the maypole be taken down and obliterating all trace of Thomas Morton's settlement. Um, in the 19th century, the whole episode is in a rather romanticized tale. It's, it's represented by, in a tale by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I can't remember the exact title, actually. And, and uh, here is... Oh, it's that it's called yes, exactly the Maypole of Merrymount, um, which I think is is first published in eighteen thirty six. Um, here there is a slight hint of pipe and, ta pipe and tabor in the list of performing instruments at the May Day celebrations, which feature quite strongly in in um, in Hawthorne's account. Immediately a prelude of pipe, cittern, and viol touched with practiced minstrelsy. So he's got there some antique instruments, um, the ones he could remember, but probably has no first-hand knowledge of, including pipe, unspecified, a cittern, by that stage, probably completely unknown. Vials had pretty well disappeared as then, by then as well. Anyway, they were practiced upon with, with practice, blown upon with practice minstrelsy. The interesting thing is, this is a, a contemporary picture. It actually comes from the early publication of this tale, but it's got a chap playing it upon what might well be a pair of two, three hole pipes. That 
actually is the sum total of what I have managed to find in the way of three whole pipes in the early settlements of New England. But it's a very interesting tale. In particular, it shows, I mean, um, um, there was no question of any, any Morris dancing at this point in New England. It was totally banned. Maypoles were heavily, I mean, Morris would be very much looked at askance. Maypoles, likewise, you wouldn't get away with that. You might well have had a bit of dance, but it was very um, sedate and, and unlikely to have been um, accompanied by pipe and tabor. By the time dancing had come through, there are various... Uh, Yes, I have this there, there are a lot of um, pamphlets published against any form of dancing. They didn't like it at all, but it did happen. And it did happen later in that century, or certainly early in the 18th century, and mostly in taverns. Um, by that time, early 18th century, the fiddle had taken over from the pipe and tabor as an accompaniment for dance, and its other role playing for the military was taken over by the, the Fife. So our search has failed. This is our conclusion. Our search has failed to find any signs of pipe and tabor in Puritan New England, despite there being no overt prohibition of the instrument. The reason may be that the Puritans' general hostility had to dance led them to destroy all such instruments as a way of discouraging dancing. Dance, however, is re reinstated in the 1700s, though not without considerable opposition from the Puritans, but by then pipe and tabor had been replaced by fiddle. I was looking for a, um, a contemporary New England picture, but I couldn't find one. So this is a, an, an 18, early 18th century May Day scene from England the artist is unknown. The original is in the Elmbridge Museum over in Surrey. That concludes my little piece about New England. However, I would just like to finish by, oh no, sorry, one more sighting. This is from a, um, a, pencil, a German Bible in Pennsylvania late in the 18th century. And what it shows, I had, when I saw, I first saw an image of this, I thought, the musicians are down here on the left, the dancers are up on the right. It's in a tavern and the musicians are playing two fiddles and something else which I had hoped might have been a pipe and tabor. Uh, but the image I had was really rather poor. I, I did manage to find a much better one and it, dis, it is clearly a French horn. So we've got an interesting dance band here of two fiddles and a French horn playing for dancing, late 18th century, in a Pennsylvania tavern. Uh, of course, the, um, the picture is here, and they're rather castigating the idea of dancing in taverns and dancing in general. So it doesn't, it's not a possible sighting. Um, unfortunately, it's clearly a horn. However, what we have, this is the, by way of epilogue, two, two finds from the settlement in Jamestown, Virginia, that Andy talked about. Uh, these are discoveries during excavations. I think it was a latrine. Th interesting things are usually found in latrines. <laughs> these are two um, archaeological investigations over the last, probably within, within the last couple of decades, um, a, a tambourine jungle and a trumpet mouthpiece, both dated to the 1610s, the, the period about which Andy was talking. Uh, tambourine jingle, trumpet mouthpiece, brass and tambourines. It looks to me, it can only mean one thing, that the Salvation Army bands got there first. That's my conclusion. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, excellent. excellent. <laughs> <laughs> very amusing and um, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I'm fascinated uh, by what you're finding, especially around the a whole business of the maypole. I'd heard about the maypole, but I didn't really know much about the story. And because uh, I, I lived many years in Plymouth, and the Mayflower, the story of Mayflower, was a was a big thing. And uh, um, then I worked 
Was that Plymouth, Massachusetts? No, I worked in Plymouth, Devon. Devon. All right. Okay. Then I did go and work in uh, Massachusetts. And so uh, a lot of my friends actually very much involved in the uh, Plymouth plantation and, uh, and all those things that go on down there. So there's, um, there's uh, a lot of stuff going in there. Yeah. And, um, uh, so, you know, getting these stories, and I'm very interested in the history of maypoles. Uh, the, the, the story of, of Wollaston, although it is quite well known, it's it's very largely suppressed. Whenever you get um, sort of celebrations of the Mayflowers, are it's 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 there in the background, but it's very much a kind of you know, an alternative view of what might have been, and I think it's quite a fascinating thing. Excellent. Well, excellent. I think. Um, uh, I'm just going to um, invite uh, our other intend attendees uh, to uh, join us on the screen if they are um, so uh, uh, inclined. And um, I've promoted them all. So, so that uh -huh. just while just yeah. while Steve is doing that, yes. So. When I was learning a few years back and I had a quite a strong influence was was Dick Bagwell and his tutor book. And I, I just wonder when when the the Tabor pipe managed to re-enter the uh, the lost colonies. I think it was probably with Dick Bagwell. You think so? <laughs> I'd, I'd love to know. I'd love to know if there were, I mean, it probably did come before, but I'd, I'd love to know if he's found any record of uh, of its early emergence. There is a there is a, a very interesting paper published some years ago, looking at instances of the Morris dance in New England prior to 1913, and there are one or two cases there where they believe they have Morris dance. Um, I can send a reference to that. Um, but I, I, with the Morris dance of that period, they may well have had pipe and tabor. So that would be that would be where I would look for for um, you know recorded instances of of pipe and tabor. There was nothing in the, in that particular paper. There was nothing to say that they had pipe and tabor. But um, it it might well have been the case. Any, any other any other questions that you can see? I would like uh, to welcome. Uh, uh, how do you pronounce it? Johanny Garcia. Hola. Johnny Garcia. Johnny Johnny Garcia. Hola. <laughs> You're welcome. Muchas gracias. Hello. Thank you very much. Hello to everyone. <laughs> so uh, Johnny is in uh, in Ecuador, yes. Sí, estoy en Ecuador. Ecuador. And um, who do we have here? Hello, Jeremy. Good to see you. Hi. Uh, so um, uh, uh, we've got, I think we've got most of our attendees on on here. Oh, Donald is. Donald, still. yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, uh, any, uh, any of you got some questions for um, for Bill here? I think, Jeremy, this is not in your, your area of, uh, of period of interest. Mm, subjects of interest, interested in Maple generally. Um, yes, but, uh... so um, when you were um, researching this bill, um, uh, you, you kept saying, you know, uh, unfortunately, no mention of Tabras here. <laughs> it sort of it sort of reminded me of this thing where you know, sort of the 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 the, 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 the absence of something in records. Um, uh, sometimes means it's there, but other times it means um, it wasn't considered important. Uh, I think in this case, it, the absence is actually quite significant. It, it was so prevalent in England at that time, um, there, were, there were pictures and accounts and so on, um, that, the, that the fact that there is no mention whatsoever um, in the records of early New England it sort of means that that they had they, that they what else would you have used to dance to um what else would you it means that there was no morris there was no sort of general social dancing until the violin comes in the fiddle comes in much later in the century 
Um, so it's just, a, I find it surprising that it's not there. Yeah, I, I suppose the, um, the Puritans, uh, well, I mean, the, these were far to the right of the Puritans, weren't they? They were. These were the separatist lot. But on the other hand, um, during the 1630s, after the 1630s, there was a lot of opposition to the book of sports being made, like a, a kind of call it compulsory reading um, and a lot of Puritans left during that period but of course once the Civil War started they they often a lot of them came back so um, hmm, I, I, I don't know I, I, they didn't again there's no record of them taking pipe and tabors let alone Morris dancing or maypoles with them but it's true the the original pilgrims were very much separatists and I think you've got to think more of ISIS rather than happy Anglican yeah. <laughs> you know it's not they were a tough lot they were a tough lot they even executed um, um, Quakers for goodness sake I mean that's that's pretty serious <laughs> blasphemy was a hanging offense uh, <laughs> I can't think the Tabor Society would have lasted very long in that <laughs> In that constituency, frankly, <laughs> uh, when you when you read the polemics against uh, dancing and music by the uh, Puritans, uh, what's his name, Philip Oates, and people like that, it, it's um, it, you know, it, and to think these these separatists were were um, you know more extremist than that, uh, uh, you know, whereas the polemics were uh, telling people to shun themselves with this thing the separatists were a bit more black and white about it weren't they yeah they were, they, they, they were. it was it was hmm. there, there, there were parallels earlier in england actually the the guildford summer poll um uh ba basic basically there was uh there was a puritan opposition to that in in the in the uh, 16th century yeah and um and they they threw the the organizer into the into the town jail, which you can go and visit now. And there's reference to the fact that the um, that the pole the the, the pole was um, it was was just sort of left to decay, um, propped up against the um, the parish church there. And then uh, he he successfully managed to get some um, um, high level backing from from a member of the government because he um, he managed to to plead the the case that in fact when the, when the pole had been taken down it had it had the royal um, royal flag on it and therefore the people who who had um, had objected to the pole were, 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 were then sort of viewed as opposition and therefore they they were put in a bad light and he was he was released from prison and he was able to um, to, to run the summer poll again but the, the summer poll in Guildford was um, very much associated with Morris dancing, so I, I don't know. I don't know if all um, it, and 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 uh, I know that the one in in 1660 when um, Charles II um, came back. I know the one to to welcome him in the Strand was very much associated with with Morris dancing, but I, I don't know. I don't know whether by the by the the period that we're talking about in Merrymount whether that would have been associated with Morris dancing or not? Do you, do you have any idea? Uh, no, there, there's no actual mention of, of Morris uh, in at, at the um, the Merrymount settlement um, or in, in the in the New Canaan book. Um, actually, I must check that again. I'm, I, I'm pretty sure there's not. There's certainly no mention of explicit mention of Pipe and Tabor. There is certainly mention of dance but not uh, not specifically Morris dance. That, that's rather specific, and and it would have meant that the um, the young men who went out there as uh, to, as part of these settler group um, would have known Morris dance and and had that. And um, it looks as though they they didn't. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it, um, it's uh, it's a very interesting thing that the. I showed earlier the the image from um, uh, Hello, Christine Elizabeth Elizabeth Hi. Christine, <laughs> from Washington State, where it's sometime early in the morning, I think. <laughs> um, but um, the image I showed of the um, uh, yeah the early Morris dance image of them dancing around the Maypole, 
and uh, right from the early part of the 16th century, uh, Morris got tagged on to the, the idea of Whitson and the Whitson Ale, the church ale. So very much the Maypole was connected to the church then uh, in, in that respect, the Whitson Ale. But the Maypole goes back much earlier to the 12th century mm. and, um, and we uh, believe that its primary focus of purpose was to say it is like a status symbol this town this village this settlement is big enough to have a May Fair and the May Fair was the main um, uh, opportunity in that period to buy things because there was no uh, shops as such uh, the traders came round and they'd come to your village for the May Fair, uh, which was around that time of, of year. It might actually have been in, in April, it might have been in June. <laughs> that's, that's very interesting, Steve, because one of the references in Morton's book is to the Maypole being a sign of the settlement so that the traders, presumably the, the, the natives, could, could find it as a trading post. Yes. So it, was, it was bound up with a... Um, uh, with trading and all of that, a May Fair in a way was, was yeah. part of it. So, you know, we had this system of fairs that came at different times of the year. And the May Pole or the May, the May Fair, even though it's called the May Fair, could have, because it couldn't be everywhere at once, it moved around the different settlements. Right. Um, but it would go to the places that had the, the, the May Pole. And um, it was, um, and so it's, it was primarily a, um, a civic uh, object, mm. but a focal point for the, for the party. And the concept of it being a pagan thing, which you mentioned there, um, and was mentioned by Philip Stubbs, um, uh, was, well, it didn't come until the, you know, the, the 17th century. And the concept of pagan then meant uh, pertaining to the, really pertaining to the, the Greek myths and the Roman myths. Yeah, the, the, um, in Morton's book, it's very much presented as a kind of romanticized Greek Roman, the, the mythology uh, that he recounts as part of his whole ceremonial thing is very much Greek. Greek. Greek mythology. Um, so it, 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 was, it had several different functions. I mean, one, it was very tall, it was 80 feet tall, and it was, it was to indicate where the, where the trading post was. It was also something to dance around, and he was very much caught up in, in um, uh, sort of humanist knowledge. Greek mythology was part of what he knew about. And so in his book, he, he sort of trans he translates it all into that sort of thing. Um, and that, of course, has taken up, that, this makes the Puritans, they were totally hostile to this. <laughs> it, was, it was just so much again. Their real opposition, however, was simply to the success of his um, settlement in, as a trading thing. They, he was much more successful with the natives um, than they were. They were having a hard time, um, whereas he was doing very, very nicely here generally very good relationships with them and um, was, was doing very well indeed, which they, of course, didn't like in the least. Uh, I, as I was listening to Radio 3 uh, this week, which had a whole series of essays in the evening about uh, the Mayflower. And uh, part of that subject has been to do with um, uh, the different the different things that were happening with the merchant adventurers, which Morton, Morton really represented, mm -hmm. and children fathers, and how different their objectives were. Mm. Yeah. Oh, were fascinating. Anyway, absolutely yeah. fascinating. Especially in relation to Andy's, um, uh, Andy's talk earlier about Jamestown. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Steve. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. I I've got to go now. My my takeaway fish and chips has just arrived. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so oh, that's a, yeah. a priority. But um, I just wanted to say I think it's been a, a very interesting session this afternoon, and um, you know we, we we don't have to have it every 
year, do we? We can have it one every of these two <laughs> in a shorter. Yes, one doesn't, one doesn't just have a maypole on May Day. It can well, something yeah. like that, yeah. <laughs> I was also I wanted to yeah. say yes, to all uh, a special yeah. thank you to uh, to Johnny Garcia Coque for coming. Uh, it's an it's un placer tenerte con nosotros. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Muchas gracias. Uh, and, Thank uh, you very much. <laughs> and perhaps in future we can think about um, finding out more about the pipe and tabor in Central and South America. Yes, and that would be I'm nice. sure would be that nice. Steve and I and other members of the Tabers can help with any language issues on that and help facilitate that, that it. That would be really wonderful. We would really like that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, good. anyway, that's what I thought. But I've got to go now because food is on the table. Okay. <laughs> well, See you later, well, then. Uh, come and join us for the concert. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Many people <laughs> are coming. Well, uh, wait, wait a moment. Wait a moment. I think uh, Elizabeth was wanting to speak. Oh. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, I knew Dick Bagwell really well um, on the West Coast, and we did lots of Morris things and ales with him. And of course his book, I had his book years ago, but he was in a show in Portland. Uh, it was the Christmas Revels and he played a part. Uh, he played the musician to the Will Kemp show. And I have the video and I've taken Dick's scenes out and put them on a little video that I will share with the group with a few pictures. Uh, and things. Uh, his daughter and I have been corresponding and, you know, he passed away uh, t a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, and we're all going to miss him. So we're trying to compile things. Um, so I will send this out, uh, put it on a YouTube video for everyone to see if you want to, we could add it somehow. Yes, but it was, it was yeah. in the Portland Revels, a uh, big stage show. It's, it's a huge production and we all fell in love with the instrument just hearing him play these symphony horn players and musicians from everywhere were, were watching him with fascination and he gave me his D pipe and uh -huh. I started learning so I'll send that out to the group yes please that's fantastic thank you thank you Elizabeth that's really great yeah, and Elizabeth, we can work out if you like. We can uh, put it up onto the uh, Tabras um, Society YouTube channel. I will send it to you as soon as it's finished. It's just part of what I'm doing, but I'll send it to you on the Google Drive. So yeah. put it in the folder, maybe. Or that okay. would be marvelous, marvelous. Right. Yes. Um, have we got any anybody from YouTube uh, asking any questions? No, oh, I think we're through. All of the main sets of questions. There was a, a Bob Bird was asking about the, um, the 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 fingering of the pipes on the Mary Rose. Right, that's a good uh, that's a good point. Uh, the Mary Rose um, was interesting. Um, I don't know who who was here. I don't know, Bill. You were here, I think, when when we had the Mary Rose pipes. Yeah. The, um, the, the Nick Perry made copies of the Mary Rose pipes. And uh, there are two pipes roughly in C, I think they are. And the other is a very long D or low C pipe. Uh, and the stretch, we know who played it, we know the name of the Tabor. Apparently had, I don't know, the arms of a gorilla or something. <laughs> impossible. It's a terrible thing. But, um, the fingering, uh, I think, Nick, Rick, that it was the standard, um, what we call it, TTS um, setup of fingering. One of the, two of them were, and one of them wasn't. Oh, is that is that true? Right. It may yeah. well be the big one then. Could might have been something different. Yeah. So it, there was one pipe which is close to a, a standard G pipe in size, right. and then two lower ones. Um, uh, and ostensibly, when you looked at them, um, the two of the pipes would have played together, but the third one was uh, was in a key that was not compatible. But when you took into account the fact it was a TST pipe, 
uh, it was playing in a different mode and mm -hmm. would then match in with the other two pipes. Yeah. And the other thing is there was a tabber found as well there. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, I don't I don't know if the definitive account of the pipes has ever been written. Do you know, Steve? Is um, there is a um, <coughs> uh, uh, what's his name? Keith, 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 Keith. Uh, who, McGowan? Uh, Keith McGowan would know. McGowan. I think he wrote something on them. It could be. Yeah, Keith would know because he does play pipe and tabor. Um, Terry would, would have known because he made copies, uh, but I don't recall seeing the whole thing sort of written up as a, you know, serious academic piece. So I don't, I just don't know. But I think you're probably right. Yes, my, my recollection right. is <laughs> the long ones were slightly different. Nick reckoned that the long pipe may well have been played way up in, in the upper register rather than down below. So again, it's it's still up we up in the air. We, we need to, but another experiment needs to be done. I, I have no. I did try. You probably have tried the long the copy of the long one as well, and it's just so unmanageable. I just gave up. I can't. My <laughs> well, uh, in order for me to play it, um, you know, I'm six foot tall, and I was stretching like this, and if I gripped it with my teeth, and I got a uh, thing in my hand. And in the end, we taped it to my hand with sellotape. Uh, <laughs> and my fingers had to play sort of like Fujara, like um, you didn't play across the pipe, you played like this to be able to, to get the right uh, hold. It, he must have had huge hands. But well, when I say that, um, Nick plays it. And um, Nick, I'm sure Nick's shorter than me. Mind you, his, his hands, knuckles hang around his knees. <laughs> <laughs> very long arms and when he plays it he can play it right up into the third octave no problem at all you know it's like playing the um uh the uh the solver peeper you know the the the, the swedish overtone pipe and things like um, that yeah yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. uh, excellent Anyway, oh, we've got something up on the Q&A here. Um, oh, uh, there is Michelle. I'm going to ask um, Michelle in. Mike, Michelle Bellon. And um, <laughs> uh, coming in. Hello. I think I might head for tea, if that's OK, because we're back at seven, aren't we? We are back at seven uh, for the beginners workshop. Um, so if you want to be in on that, that is a Zoom only. And you have to get um, you have to get your code from either me or Andy Richards. Um, that is a Zoom event only. And then uh, this after this evening at nine o'clock, there's a concert, and the the um, it that's on YouTube premiere uh, tonight at nine o'clock, and it's interactive. So if you've been watching on YouTube, you've got a, a chat screen down the side. And uh, we'll have all that going on the uh, on the the show tonight. And I've put the link up on uh, the YouTube channel at the moment, and it's on the festival program on the website. So you'll be able to find that. I would like to apologise for the hiccup at the beginning, having set up and practiced and tried linking um, Zoom to YouTube. It just wouldn't link to the YouTube that I'd set up. <laughs> I don't know why. Um, uh, you know, it worked every other time. I must have done it 50 times this week, uh, practicing, and uh, it just didn't. Michel! Bonjour! Michel! Ah, bien! Ah, <laughs> bonjour, Michel! <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm really sorry about uh, that, and I'm going to try and make sure it works for the next ones, but I'm not totally convinced so anybody who's um watching and goes to one of the links and it doesn't work on youtube what you can do is go to the tabras uh, society channel on youtube and uh the the program will come up on there and you'll be able to watch it uh so uh um that's the fallback position yeah. 
Anyway, closing remarks, Bill? Uh, well, just to say thank, thanks very much to all you speakers and even more thanks to the audience for coming to, to listen to <laughs> um, attempt to attempts to entertain you to some uh, to what we to what we have found out uh, in the course of our researches into the the noble art of tabering. So, <laughs> thank you and hope to see you again over this weekend uh, when we have lots of exciting things too, Zoom wise. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bill and Steve as well. Thank you. Steve, both you. thank you. Yeah, huge amount of work from both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. And um, now we'll Bye. see you all later. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the festival. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.